This happened many years ago, when I worked on the 14th floor of an office building in San Francisco. I started work at around 8 a.m. before the building opened. At this time, the front doors were still locked. The front desk and security usually got there at around 8.30 a.m. I used my fob and walked to the building's first floor, which was nothing but a lobby and six elevators. Immediately, I saw someone standing there, right in front of those elevators. They had this huge jacket on and a hood completely covering their face. He never looked directly at me, but instead kept staring at those elevators. Usually, I was the only person in the building that early. My co-worker, who also started at 8, would sometimes arrive at the same time as me, but usually I rode the elevator by myself. I walked up and pressed the up button and waited for the elevator to arrive. The person just kept standing there completely ignoring me, in front of the furthest elevator from the entrance. Something you need to know is that the elevators are locked until the building is open. You have to put in a code, and each floor has a separate one. For instance, my floor's code would be something like 141414. If you punched it in, it would take you to the 14th floor. The other five elevators only go up to the 10th floor. Only elevator number one goes to 11 to 14. So, as I wait there, I hear this person begin whispering to themselves. They steal a glance at me, then look forward straight at the elevator again. I was getting a bit weirded out at this point. But since you need a key to even get in, I was still sort of assuming he must work there or something and was just waiting for the elevator. Elevator number six opens and he walks inside. I stay there waiting for elevator number one to get to my floor. I felt an instant feeling of relief as the door shut closed behind him. I began to hear my elevator traveling down to the lobby when I realized that his had never started moving up. Instantly, I realized he did not work here. He clearly didn't know the code to get it to move. The doors to elevator one finally open. I rush in and start punching in my code immediately. Right as the doors are about to shut closed, a hand grabs them and forces them open. The man gets in, and the doors close as the elevator begins going up. He presses the button for floor five, but it doesn't light up. The elevator just keeps on climbing and passes right by the fifth floor. He's not even looking at me, kind of whimpering and grabbing his arms, reaching into the inside of his jacket. I didn't say anything, but I moved into the corner as far away from him as possible. He kept glancing back over to me, whimpering and rocking back and forth a little, his hand now just inside his inner jacket pocket fumbling around. Once the elevator reached the 14th floor, I booked it. He just stayed there. My office had the entire floor, but there was still another locked door to get into our lobby from the elevator. I ran towards it, with my key already in my hand. I began to try and unlock it when I realized to my horror that just like a fucking movie scene, the lock would not turn. Our doors were glass. I saw my co-worker already at his desk inside, looking at me, realizing something was not right. I turned back to look behind me, only to see the man in the elevator, now sprinting full speed at me. His teeth were gritting, and he was screaming. Things felt like they were in slow motion. I started pounding helplessly on the door. Somehow, this made my key click in, and the door opened. I slammed it shut behind me, as he smashed directly into it. My co-worker and I called 911 right away, but the worst part was, it took them 20 minutes to arrive. We had to just stand there in front of these glass doors, watching this man, who put his face right up against the glass and began licking it and screaming at us. He couldn't even leave the lobby if he wanted to, because you needed the code to get back down. So we had to just stand there and watch him until the police finally arrived and arrested him. Last December, I was visiting my family down in Florida, and we spent some time at Treasure Island. My brother and I took my dog down to the beach at around 2 a.m. to play some fetch, drink, and have a good time. 
If you walk along the water, you can reach a few restaurants, bars, and hotels, which all line the beach. Out of nowhere, as we were walking, we see someone begin moving pretty quickly in our direction from over there. A few moments later, we could begin to make out that they were being followed. My dog is arguably well-trained. We work search and rescue, after all. I've never once had her run off without permission, and never once has she not instantly returned when called. But that changed that night. She was about five feet away from me when I saw her hackle shoot up. I went to grab her collar, but she took off in a full sprint, making some truly terrifying barking and growling sounds. We obviously took off right after her, and she reached the first person. She stopped between them and the people behind them. She was barking and growling and lunging. Finally, I managed to catch up and put her on her leash. She never reacted in that manner before, so it was really scary. As we approached the woman, we could see that the group that was following her was composed of about three men that were probably in their early 30s or so. Immediately as we approached, they started booking it in the opposite direction. I turned around. I noticed the person being followed was a young woman about my age. We asked if she was okay, and she just broke down in tears and collapsed into my brother. My dog insisted she get on the ground for excited puppy kisses and a soaking wet cuddle, which they both seemed to enjoy and need. In the moment, she was far too overwhelmed to talk, so she got into her phone and rang her friend's number to have us talk to her. We were able to figure out where she was staying and walked her back to her hotel, where we met up with her friends. We all exchanged numbers to talk at a later time. The next day, we all got together. We learned that she had gone out for a walk on the beach around the same time as us and stopped for a drink at a nearby bar. She drank a bit of it and immediately was not feeling right. She left the bar because of this and soon noticed that three men had left after her. She had been walking for about a mile at this point, terrified and slowly getting more and more fucked up. She couldn't even remember much about the night. We knew she'd probably been on something, but we had no clue that she'd been drugged. Thankfully, we were able to help. We're still friends now, and we're all gonna meet up for spring break when we'll be back in Florida, actually. I've never been more proud of my dog, and more grateful that we were in the right place at exactly the right time. I hate even thinking about what could have happened to her. This happened in January or February of 2002. I, female, had just turned 21 at the time and was living with my father in Ohio. For context, I was extremely naive and living a pretty directionless life. I'd grown up in an affluent area of Seattle, went to a private school, went to college, and dropped out. I was dealing with major depression and partying a lot, hanging out with the wrong crowd, hooking up with random strangers. My mom really didn't know what to do with me, so she sent me to live with my dad across the country in Columbus. Now, I'd been living in Ohio with my dad, and pretty much lived like an entitled teenager. I did have a job in retail, but other than that, I really sat around and didn't do much. My dad is actually an alcoholic as well, so it's not like he was of much help. At some point, seeing him passed out in the living room one morning and working a dead-end job, it kind of got me wanting to return home to Seattle. My mom, though, was unwilling to let me live with her again. So I called up my best friend at the time. Her mom was almost like my family. They didn't have a lot of money themselves, but they bought me a bus and train ticket back home. They said I could stay with them until I got back on my feet. I was extremely grateful and relieved. My dad was sad to see me go, but he agreed to drop me off at the bus station downtown. The thing is, he had to take me before his work shift. My bus actually didn't leave until later in the afternoon, so I'd basically have to wait from 9am all the way until we boarded. My dad was very nervous about leaving me there by myself. He warned me even that this station was in a rough part of Columbus, although all of Columbus is somewhat rough and that I'd need to be extra careful. Uh-huh, I was thinking. Yeah, okay. 
I was totally oblivious. My dad drove me to the Greyhound station. It was surrounded by people waiting for their buses, a few stragglers outside the entrance as well. It was quite a cold day outside. The inside was pretty much empty. My dad helped me bring my luggage in. Two large suitcases containing pretty much all of my possessions. If I didn't want to be dragging them around with me all day, I had to pay to store them in a locker by the desk. I can't remember exactly how much it was, but I was flat broke, and I couldn't spare money for something like that. I gazed warily at the clock. My dad looked at me with sadness. I could tell he was very worried about me traveling by myself. I hugged him though and tried to look as confident as possible. We said our goodbyes and he left. I've traveled numerous times, made several trips by plane myself, and have traveled to various countries with groups as well. I was not adverse to adventure. What I was definitely not good at though was reading people. I genuinely saw the good in everyone and never had a negative experience, even at 4 a.m. in downtown Seattle. If you know anything about Seattle, it has a very robust public transportation system. I was no stranger to weirdos, drunk people, hostile exchanges between people on the bus. Usually I just ignore or continue walking. In this situation, I felt like I was totally in my element, as I'd taken public transportation many times alone. Back to the Greyhound station, I decided to go outside and have myself a cigarette. The only conundrum was I had to keep an eye on my two suitcases as well. I positioned them near the front desk in such a way that I could see them clearly from the entrance. I then headed outside to get my nicotine fix. I stood a bit off to the right in front of the door. I was smoking and trying to shuffle through my extremely cheap and very ugly purse, which contained my passport because, duh, I was totally irresponsible and had lost my driver's license. As I was shuffling around, though, a man in a large knitted hat came up and asked me for a cigarette. I glanced at him. Sure thing, why not? I handed him one and a light. We chatted briefly and I studied his face. He wasn't exactly unattractive, not scary looking either, maybe a bit disheveled, but I couldn't tell whether he was homeless or not, really. No, immediate flags is what I'm trying to say. I felt safe as the outside of the terminal was littered with people, some even smoking like me, others walking briskly to their destinations. Notably, an older gentleman was also standing opposite me on the left side of the entrance. As I was talking to the man in the hat, this older gentleman seemed to be staring at me intently. The man in the hat asked where I was from. Was I catching a bus? even commented about the cold weather. In passing, I casually lamented that I was running low on cigarettes. He looked at me and said, Oh, uh, there's a gas station just around the corner. You can grab some from there. I thought this through for a moment. My bus would not come for hours yet. I could easily grab a pack and be back in time. Something stopped me, however, as I remembered my luggage sitting there unattended. I said I'd think about it and turned to go back inside. Hours pass. Every once in a while, I would go back outside to smoke. The man in the hat seemed to be there every time. At one point, he even mentioned the gas station again. It's just right up there. I can take you if you want. Again, I declined. And not because I'm scared, either. It's because I was worried about my luggage. Instead, I went back inside. Well, for the final time before my bus arrives, I go outside. This time, though, the street is eerily quiet. There's no one there. I grab another cigarette and place my purse on the ground by my feet. I look up. The man in the hat is right there. He asks me for money. This is where my gut finally turns, and I begin to feel uneasy. I don't have much. I can't help you. I hurriedly finished my cigarette, as I was suddenly very aware of my purse laying next to my feet exposed. I leaned over quickly to pick it up and mumbled something about going back inside. Instead, though, the man in the hat reached out and grabbed my purse away from me. Let me help you with that. My body seemed to drain itself, and I immediately went to pull it closer to me. I'm good. Immediately, it was like a sudden switch from the harmless random dude asking for a cigarette into a nasty, vicious thief. Give me the purse, you bitch! I was struggling against him now, 
desperate as I realized no one was there any longer to help me. I started screaming. The man in the hat shoved me, and his hip pushed me against the wall. Shut the fuck up! I was desperate now. This guy could easily pull out a knife and shank me, or even beat me up and nobody would even be there to notice. I clung to my purse, and hoped to God the cheap handles would hold together. His hands got on top of mine, and he shoved me once more. I screamed louder. From my left, I suddenly heard a voice call out. Hey, what are you doing? Remember the older gentleman from earlier? He seemingly stepped out of nowhere and loudly asked what was going on. I shoved the man in the hat hard with my left thigh. I think he realized in that moment if he did anything to me, he could easily be identified. He let go of my purse finally and ran off into the distance. I was shaking. I tearfully ran inside, leaving the older gentleman out there by himself. I was too frightened to say thank you. I spent the rest of the day hovering by the front desk. I thought of the three-day trip ahead of me and shook with dread. I held my purse in my hands in a vice grip. When my time finally came to board the bus to the train station, I glanced in terror over at the other passengers. No way I was going to be sitting next to anyone now. Every person had suddenly become a potential criminal. I slumped into a seat and cowered by the window. I heard a voice behind me again. I was going to warn you, you know, said the voice. I whipped my head around. There was the older gentleman, casually sitting behind me. My eyes were probably as large as dinner plates. I could see right away he was targeting you. You need to be more careful. I cheerfully thanked him. He just stared out the window and nodded politely. We did not speak again. Honestly, that moment changed my life. My struggle with that man in the hat must have only taken 30 seconds, but the repercussions last even 20 years later. I think back to how adamant that man in the hat was about me going around the corner to the gas station. My hair still stands on end when I think about it. Would he have robbed me over a few measly dollars in my purse? murdered me, raped me, who knows? It chills my blood to think about it. I spent the next three days paranoid and unwilling to leave my luggage unattended. I clung to my purse and used it as a pillow even on the train when laying down. When I used the restroom, I rolled my luggage into that tiny bathroom with me. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. In chilling contrast, the train trip was actually quiet and uneventful. Staring out the window as we entered Washington State, the snowfall and evergreen trees weighed down by heavy snow. I was no longer the naive and reckless young woman I had been at the Greyhound station. I had changed, just like that. So this happened 20 years ago now, but it's one of my most vivid memories I still have from my childhood. One night, my parents and my best friend's parents decided to take us out to a little neighborhood Italian restaurant for dinner. It was a cozy, quiet little place we'd been to a million times before. It was walking distance from our apartment building, after all. It was set back into a little strip mall that basically completely shut down after dark except for a donut shop that stayed open quite late. This was the San Fernando Valley in the early 90s. So, it was a very sleepy area. Streets were very empty during the night. Just behind the restaurant, a steep hill loomed up to form a hilly part of the city. Me, 8 years old, and my BFF, 10 years old, had just finished our food and asked to go sit in front of the restaurant on the benches by the front door. It was still within eyesight of our parents, but a little autonomy, you know. We were sitting there chatting happily when suddenly a huge Rottweiler wearing a collar that was dragging a long broken chain behind it came walking past the restaurant, heading out of the parking lot towards the busy street that bordered it. We were really surprised to see such a big, beautiful animal just abandoned in a parking lot at night, but we let him pass by since he seemed like he knew where he was going. We also weren't about to test to see if he was friendly since he looked an awful lot like Cujo. Only... Five minutes later, a man in an open-top jeep drove by and stopped right in front of us. Hey there, did you girls just see a dog pass through here? He was riding in my jeep and he jumped off for no reason. 
I can't seem to find him. See? He even broke his chain. He held up a length of chain attached to one of the jeep's roll bars. Wanting to be helpful, we said, Yeah, yeah, we saw him. He went that way. We pointed toward the busy road, but instead of following in the direction we pointed, he parked the car right in front of us. Well, maybe he hasn't gotten too far yet. Would you girls mind helping me look? Red flag. But, like the dumbasses we were, we said, Sure, a lost doggy. What could be more potent to a little girl's heart? The man told us to follow him, and started heading in the opposite direction from where the dog went, into a dark service alley behind the restaurant. On one side of the little walkway was the hillside slanting up at an 80 degree angle, and on the other was the unlit industrial back of the restaurant. Just as we were beginning to follow him back behind the corner, our parents happened to be exiting at the very same moment. When they didn't immediately see us out front, they started calling our names. We told him sorry, but now we had to go. When we explained to our parents where we'd been and how we'd been helping with a dog recovery mission, my mom's head just about exploded. Both our moms actually started screaming at us for being so stupid, then screaming for where the man was. We hadn't seen him ever since we'd left him in the alley behind the restaurant. They said they were going to call the police and have him arrested, or even kill him themselves if they got their hands on him. They wouldn't believe us when we told them we had seen a dog pass right in front of us, dragging along that broken chain that exactly matched his story. But, in retrospect, why would an adult man ask two little girls to help him search for his dog down an unlit back pathway? He must have planned it all. I was 24 with a two-year-old son whose father had recently relapsed on drugs. This got us evicted after him blowing through just about every dime of savings we had. Shamefully, I went back to live at my parents' house while I worked to get back on my feet. I should add that they lived in an upper-middle-class neighborhood on the good side of our city and had lived there for almost 20 years at this point. The night before this incident happened, I was quite restless and couldn't sleep at all, so I went downstairs in hopes that watching murder mysteries on the living room TV would lull me deep into dreamland. Yes, I am that type. My father, always a warrior, double-checked all the windows, locks, and ensured the garage door was closed, as he did every night. My mother and siblings would often tease him because of his over-precautions, especially since we felt extremely safe and comfortable in that neighborhood. He went to bed, though, and I ended up falling asleep on the couch. I was awoken early next morning to the sounds of my father in the kitchen, preparing to leave for work for the day. I got myself and my son dressed, and prepared to depart for work as well. My father proceeded to head to his car in the garage, when he noticed that the garage door was already fully opened. Frustrated, he turned to me immediately and told me to always make sure the garage door was down before going to bed. I figured he must have forgotten to check it the night before or something, and shrugged it off as nothing. Since my parents utilized the garage to park their two vehicles, I had to park my car on the street at the end of the curved driveway. There was very little visibility of my car from the garage entrance. I pick up my son and head out the door to go to work. As I'm approaching my car, though, I notice a person is sitting in the driver's seat of my vehicle. I will add that I often left my car open in case my son's now homeless father needed shelter from the rain or cold. He could always lay there in an emergency. Of course, I naturally assumed it was him at first. I opened the passenger door and leaned in, expecting him to welcome me and beg me for a ride somewhere. Instead, I see a very large, rough-looking man startle awake and stare at me. In shock, I tell him to get the hell out of my car. He then tells me it's his car and to get in so he can give me a free ride. Still holding my son, I start to scream at the man, who proceeded to move as if to grab me. At this time, a neighbor just happened to be coming down my street in their vehicle, presumably also on their way to work. I hailed him down immediately 
pointed to the man and told my neighbor to call the police, which he did right away. I finally came to my senses and realized I needed to get my son away from this situation. I retreated back inside the house and waited for the cops to arrive. It seems the man must have come to his senses as the cops were being called as well, because he ended up fleeing and crossing through some property to a parallel street in the neighborhood. The cops arrived and were unable to locate him following the direction he went. They were then notified on radio that a car had just been stolen from a neighbor on that street. There's our guy. They ended up locating him inside the vehicle a few miles away and apprehended him. Now, finding a strange man in your car is certainly odd, but here's where the story actually gets a lot creepier. The police discovered several items on the man that were stolen from various homes in the neighborhood. It turned out they also knew of him from his history of arrests, including drug and rape convictions. During questioning, the man revealed he had been working with two accomplices. They were essentially going house to house and stealing from unlocked cars. The man stated that the two other men had split away from him, and he proceeded to get into my unlocked car, where he happened to pass out until I found him. Remember how the garage door was open the morning of, thus pissing my father off? I had a push-button garage opener in the car visor. The man opened the garage door, intending to come into the house. The couch I was sleeping on was only ten feet away from the door that led out from the house to the garage. Who knows what would have unfolded if he didn't pass out, and my dad forgot to lock the door or something. Lesson learned in the end, I guess. Don't date guys that you need to leave your car unlocked for shelter. This happened maybe two hours ago or so. My roommate and I decided to take a short walk to the gas station just up the street from our house. We live in a small town in Texas, and the gas station is less than a mile up the street. We put our two new puppies on leashes and went for a fun walk at around 9.30pm for some slushies. We successfully walked the small hill to the gas station. My roommate kept the two puppies since they weren't allowed inside. I went in to use the bathroom and get us both a pina colada because that's our favorite. I pay, so far everything's fine, and the female employee compliments our dogs. Nothing harmful, just a nice lady. For context, I am disabled and training my puppy to be my service animal, as I need physical assistance. Well, my puppy decided she wasn't going to walk on the leash well. No big deal, I stop, tell her to heal, wait for her to listen and hold the command, then release. But my puppy was being especially stubborn today, so it took nearly 10 minutes to get out of the parking lot with this kind of discipline. I'm a relatively patient owner, and I almost always will wait for her to listen to a command. That is, until a red pickup truck pulled into the gas station. At first, I thought nothing of it. I mean, why would I? It's a gas station, I'm there with my friend, there's no reason to feel unsafe. That is, until this gigantic man steps out of the truck and yells at us. Hey, how much for the dogs? I wasn't comfortable answering, and my friend yelled no. He yelled once more. I said, how much for the dogs? Of course, I started getting uncomfortable. I got her at the pound. Get one of your own. They're cheap because of overflow. I continued to walk. I'm proud of you, he yelled. I thought to myself, proud of me? Why the fuck would you be proud of me? I don't even know who you are. I realized he was standing by his truck just staring me down. I never lived in a small town before. I've always been in the city and this was a very low crime area. At this point, we're back on the main street of the neighborhood. I was just walking, minding my own business, until I heard a voice screaming in the back of my head, telling me I needed to get home right now. Run. Don't let him see where you live. I thought I was just being paranoid. But then I turned around. Right there were those annoyingly bright LEDs and the same front of his truck right behind us. The second I looked back and looked into the truck, I knew it was him immediately. He pulled over onto the side of the road as soon as I saw him. Maybe he just lives here. 
but that voice in my head was still eating away at me. I gave my dog full slack and moved as fast as I could, forcing a quick pace behind my friend to make her hurry without trying to scare her. We got outside of the house, and she nonchalantly walked inside. It didn't feel right though. I needed to watch, so I made my dog heal and watched for those headlights. They weren't on though. The street has very poorly lit street lamps, but I could still barely make out the body of his red truck slowly going by. It was so quiet that I could even hear his engine click back on once he started at full stop and start speeding down the road. I debated leaving and hiding somewhere else. I didn't want him to come after my friend and her dog, but there was really nowhere to go. I ran inside, flipped off the lights, and locked the door. I just stood against it waiting for him to pass. After a long while, he finally did. I told my friend what happened, and after the initial confusion, came the realization that her car was parked outside the garage, and unlocked. It had very obvious signs of a puppy, or at least a younger dog in the front yard as well. He'd seen what side of the road we'd walked down, and approximately what area he'd stopped seeing us walk as well. She went to lock her car through the key fob, but it was not working. There had been some attempted car break-ins in the area, so she snuck out to lock it manually. She went out, put the key in the handle, and locked the door. Rounding the corner of the house again to get back to the front door, I saw her throw herself inside and slam it shut, panicked as could be. It turned out as she had rounded the corner of the house, she saw that red Ford come barreling down the street again. We'd been inside making sure everything is all locked, all curtains and blinds were closed since. And we kept hearing that car pass down our street over and over again. We don't think he saw which house was ours or her come back inside, but hopefully we never meet that guy in the red Ford again. Summer of 2018. I don't really remember what day it was exactly, but I do remember it was late June or some such. School had just ended, and I was elated to hang out with friends and relax after a tough year of grade 11. I really liked being home, just like any kid that goes to school I suppose, but especially because I was failing. My family and I lived in this very small town. I spent my whole life there, and although I liked how quiet it was, I was pretty far away from all my friends. A very lonely town. Mostly all the residents were so old, you'd barely see anyone out on the streets. Maybe the odd kid every once in a while, but it was pretty desolate. My oldest brother had a pretty crazy girlfriend in our town. She was our neighbor's granddaughter, actually. She pulled the usual manipulation tactics. Luckily, my brother didn't fall for it and eventually did break up with her. But as you can imagine, for someone like that, it was not the end of her. She and her friends ended up egging our house to hell. I'm talking dozens of eggs. It took forever to clean. A few weeks later, she left back to her town, so we never got the chance to confront her about it. My mom was pretty shaken at this though, so we decided to install cameras and light motion sensors around our house. My town had the odd weirdo or so. This one older guy that's now dead used to stalk my mom when she was working out from our backyard fence. She would catch him peering into the windows. She would also notice he would go for walks every time she would work out, so eventually she stopped. Anyway, it was June now, and my brother had just gotten accepted into a college. He was planning to play for the team. For about six days, my dad and brother went out to help him get situated with the new school. Now, it was just me and my 18-year-old brother alone in our house. The reason my mom was so okay with this was because something like our house getting egged had not happened for a really long time. My biggest fear, actually, is home robberies. It's just scary for a place you feel so safe to change in such an instant. It was about four more days until my mom and dad would get back home. Everything was actually going really fine, until it suddenly wasn't anymore. It was about 1 or 2 a.m. I don't remember exactly when. I was sitting on the couch in the living room, 
watching a movie on my laptop, being the nocturnal child as I was. The blinds were shut, so I couldn't see anything outside. I had been watching for a while, until I noticed a white light barely poking through the blinds, and it seemed to be moving. I was confused at first, so I naturally went to see what it was through my kitchen window. My heart stopped when I saw two unidentifiable silhouettes with a flashlight in the back 40 behind my house, shining it into the windows. I naturally went and woke my brother up and told him what was happening. He brushed me off saying it was probably just some people on a nighttime walk. I believed him at first, thinking it might be a reasonable excuse but it felt off that they were pointing it directly at our house and not any others. I went upstairs to check again, but now they were long gone. I sighed deeply and felt relieved, although there was now no way I was going to get to sleep now. I sat there for about a half an hour trying to sleep, when our camera service gave me a notification on my phone, saying it had just caught motion in our front yard. I was trembling with fear as I slowly checked the footage, I kept whispering to myself like a mantra, it's just a car, it's just a car. I was right, but I wish I wasn't. I watched the footage as a white Ford slowly drove past the front of our house. When I mean slowly, I mean maybe two miles an hour until they eventually passed. There's no way they're driving that slow for no reason, I thought. So again, I went and showed my brother the footage, who was now a little annoyed I'd woken him up for a second time. This time, though, he took it seriously. He looked unnerved by this footage and gave me a terrified look. How many times have they passed our house? He asked with a shake in his voice. They had only passed once so far, at least that I knew of. My brother got up immediately and locked all the doors, something we never had to do before because of how safe our town usually was. Another 20 minutes had passed at this point. Me and my brother were watching the windows. He was watching the backyard whilst I was watching the front. Then, of course, the Ford passed by the front of our house again, slowly, until it stopped dead center right in front of it. Then it hit me. They must think nobody's home, I said to my brother. That's what it had to be. None of our cars that were usually there were, because my mom didn't trust my brother and I going somewhere while they weren't at home. My brother came running over, and that's when it happened. Three men jumped out of the parked truck, slowly approaching the house. I saw one had a pistol. My brother pushed me away from the door in a panic. Holy fuck, we're being robbed, he yelled. It made it more scary because I could hear the panic and fear in his voice. My brother, someone who wasn't terrified of anything, looking scared petrified me. I ran back into the living room when I could hear our back door knob being rustled vigorously. My brother grabbed a kitchen knife and ushered him and I under the kitchen table. It went quiet, a deafening quiet. The silence was so loud. All you could hear was my brother and I's panicked breath. The front steps leading up to our door creaked under the weight of their footsteps. It was so quiet I could even hear that. The silence was broken when a brick came flying through our front door window. I was overwhelmed with fear. I wanted to scream. I bit down on my tongue so hard it started bleeding. My heart was in my throat. They're in, I thought. We had wooden floors so the floor would creak when someone stepped on it. I glanced to my brother, who put a fingertip to his mouth telling me to keep quiet. Tears were streaming down my face. A deep voice called out. Looks like no one's here. The light in the kitchen flicked on, and I saw a man's feet from under the table. The deck, my brother whispered. He was right. Our kitchen table was right next to the door of our deck. Two men came bustling up the stairs. We gotta move fast, check the whole house, and get back out to the truck as soon as possible. Don't take too long, one man said to the others. One of the men went back downstairs, while the other two stayed upstairs. I could hear trash bags being unfolded. My brother waited until they were out of the kitchen when he started quietly unlatching the deck door. It's unlocked. Move fast. He ran out and I followed without hesitation. He leapt off the deck of the two-story house. I hesitated to do so until I heard, What the fuck? being yelled out behind me. 
I immediately jumped. On landing, my ankle twisted funnily. It was so much adrenaline though, it didn't hurt until much later. My brother and I ran blindly through the dark back 40 until we got to a lit street and hid in some construction outhouses until morning. It was about an hour into the night when my ankle finally got a really sharp persistent pain. I ran on a broken ankle. The most painful night of my life, but I somehow managed to get some sleep after all of that. It was about 7am when my brother woke me, telling me they were gone. He helped me back to the house. When we called the police, it would take a while for them to get there, because we lived in such a remote town. A lot of things were missing. My phone, laptop, all of my mom's jewelry, old values she had in a china cabinet. My brother's wallet was also missing, but it turned out they hadn't taken mine. Eventually, two police showed up just to tell us there was nothing they could do except drive me to the hospital. In the end, it didn't even make the news. Go figure. This happened to me a few months back and is something I almost forgot about, at least until a friend reminded me of it yesterday and told me it still freaks her out. I don't blame her because it still bothers me too. Basically, I had been on a walk from my apartment to a convenience store for something around midday. It's only about a five minute walk and it's right next to a college campus, so there was a lot of foot traffic. It always felt relatively safe for being in a city. I was almost to the store when suddenly a dark SUV pulled up right next to me. The driver, 25 to 30 and female, waved me down. She pointed her thumb to her back seat, then gave me a thumbs up. I got the impression that maybe there was someone I knew riding with her, trying to say hi or something. That wasn't unlikely, as I had gone to school there myself and often ran into people I know. I couldn't see anything through the car's dark tinted windows initially though, so I called out to her. I have no idea what you're trying to tell me, you know. Hey, where are you heading? She asked. Her tone was light-hearted and casual. By this point, I could see no one, to my knowledge, was in the back seat at all. She seemed both put together and off-putting at the same time. It was weird. She didn't quite seem young enough to be a student there. I responded honestly and told her I was just going to the convenience store. I didn't feel like there was a real reason to lie. I mean, the campus was busy, the store was busy, and again, I was already basically there. Hey, I'm going there too. Hop in, I'll take you, she said and again gestured to her back seat. She was being weirdly pushy, and it made so little sense to offer a ride when it was basically 30 seconds around the corner. No, that's okay, I want to walk myself. I'm actually on the phone with my mom, I replied, which was actually true at the time. I was being polite, but I wanted to make it very clear she was interrupting something and I was not interested in her shit. She continued to drive slowly beside me as I walked, though, and didn't seem phased at all. Don't worry, I'll talk to your mommy for you, she teased. Come on, let's have a nice and safe drive to the convenience store. The way she said it was a little bit mocking, as if I was being unreasonable for rejecting this weird offer. I don't even know who you are, I said, still trying to maintain a casual tone by laughing her off. She wouldn't budge, though. Come on, man, you're holding up traffic, just get in. By this time, there was a huge line of cars behind her because she was just inching along beside me the entire time. A few of them even honked because by this time, the interaction had lasted a couple of minutes. You're the one holding up traffic because you're the one in the car. I responded more firmly. At this point, I think she realized I was not going to bite. All right, I'll see you at the convenience store then. Let's talk there she said before speeding off. I got to the convenience store about a minute later. There was no sign of her or her car there though, so she never actually stopped there. I'm not sure what would have happened if I'd gotten into that car. Probably I would have never ended up there either. I don't know what she wanted from me, but I guess I looked like an easy target. In spite of being 23 at the time, I looked like I was a teenager or so. Either way, I'm glad I never found out though.
I'm a 21-year-old female. This story took place when I was around 11 years old. I remember this day very clearly because it was the first time that I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14 or so, I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chattaqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone. If you thought you would get away with something, then be very prepared to have your ear abused by the time you got home. There was this one day, though. It was a very cold winter day. School, unfortunately, was still open, though, so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me a bit longer to leave the house, as I was used to walking with my older sister, since she knew the route better than I did. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was actually too sick to go to school today. Being a young brat though, I made a big deal about walking there by myself. After all, I was almost 12 years old now, and all my friend's parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long time, then told me to go but make sure I pay extra attention to cars. I had actually almost gotten hit by a car and died when I was nine, so the worry that showed up on her face was very well warranted. Hurriedly, I nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly-dally, so she was always in a rush to get there early, but seeing as it was just me this time, I thought it would be a good idea to take my sweet time and enjoy the scenery. I would play in the brown slush that was left on the side of the road and even make these funny-looking snowballs just to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school, though, I noticed a white van following slowly behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down to make another snowball, I wouldn't have even noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I did, though. I tried to tell myself I was just being stupid, but I continued a lot more hurriedly to school after I saw that. Once I got there, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the white van was still just a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was finally on school grounds that it drove away as fast as I had ever seen. I thought that would be the end of it, but throughout the day, when I would stare out the window, I would just see the van there. I assumed that it had never really left, just parked in the lot. Many adults would try to convince me years later that it maybe wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. This particular van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was inside through the tinted glass, but I knew they could see me very clearly. It was now the end of the day, and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom to come pick me up. She was at work, and my sister was at home sick. I had to just suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders and the others didn't live anywhere near me. Remembering the wise words my sister had told me, I decided to take another route home. I didn't memorize this route very clearly, but I decided that anything was better than being spotted by that van again. I made it to my main street, but I realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with the smiley emoji sticker. I tried my best to stay calm and walk past it, but once I heard that van door slide open, I started running. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer and closer, so I did what any normal kid would do in this situation. I cut a lot of corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly in sight of my house. I forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them right behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone answered. My sister looked very confused, but one look at my face and she immediately pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. 
truthfully, it stayed there the entire time until my brother got home. My sister and I don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. I hadn't thought about this incident in years, but one of my hometown friends showed me an article that came out in 2013. Apparently, some men kidnapped and sexually assaulted a girl my age. It wouldn't have scared me so much if it hadn't mentioned that particular white van. Whoever you are that attempted to kidnap me and do God knows what else, I hope we never meet again. Two years ago, I was alone in a huge city and walking by myself. I had gotten very lost and my cell phone was at about 2% battery. I was panicking already, and because of that, I was not paying attention to my surroundings the way I probably should have been. I realized I was really, really lost at this point. I felt instantly very uncomfortable, that feeling that I was being watched. I looked and saw two men standing by a car. One got inside, but it seemed like they were talking about me. The whole thing just felt very off. The car pulled away and the other guy kept walking on the other side of the street, just a little bit behind me. At the next block, he crossed over to say hi, then asked if I had an extra cigarette. I was holding my pack at the time and had just lit one while quickly looking at my phone for a map before my battery died. I gave him one because I wanted him to just leave me alone. After that, he asked me for a light. I gave him my lighter and he asked right away if I was lost. I said no. I told him I was just waiting for my husband to pick me up and he was right around the corner having just picked up his brother. Of course, this was a lie. I was actually late to meet a friend who I was meeting from an online mommy group. I had talked to this woman for years online and on FaceTime. The man told me he would wait with me. I said that wasn't necessary. I was walking toward the direction my husband was coming from already. I frantically grabbed my phone and tried to use the Uber app just to get out of there and find my friend. I should have probably done that to begin with, but I had never planned on getting so lost. Anyway, as soon as I did that, my phone died immediately, but not before he saw I had just opened the Uber app. He asked if my husband was an Uber driver or if I was just a lying bitch. I said nothing in response except, have a great night, and started walking even faster. He started texting someone and following close behind me. Ahead of us, I saw two young guys. I'm 41 and they were 21 or 22. They seemed to be about my daughter's age. I was very relieved that there was someone else around. I hadn't seen anyone the entire time since I'd gotten this lost, except some homeless woman trying to find cans in the trash and a little kid going past on a bike. I saw the two men unlock a car and start walking toward it. I picked up the pace, then saw the guy that was following me was on his phone. I saw his friend parked only a half block up the street from us, near a boarded up building. I had no idea where I was in this city, feeling more scared about these men and why one was following me and reporting to his friend in the car. I started to cry. I felt him getting closer and closer, walking even faster to match my pace. He was getting very close to me, almost able to reach me. I heard him say into the phone, Yeah, there's definitely not a husband. I'm not too concerned. Her phone died too. I knew he was talking about me. I didn't know what to do. So, I ran after those two young guys, yelling out to them. Babe, hey, babe, I'm right here. They stopped about ten feet from the car they were getting into. One started to say something like, who are you, I would imagine. But the other one saw my face, and something instantly clicked. He ran toward me and pulled me up into a big hug. There you are. I can't believe I didn't notice you right behind us. You know, I thought we lost you. Really loudly. He took my hand and pulled me over toward their car. He pulled me into a tight side hug and whispered, I hope this is okay. You look like you needed help. Is that man bothering you? All I could do was cry. The man that was following me made a beeline for the car with the other guy in it. They jumped in and sped off right away. 
the nice young men called the cops for me and gave me a power bank and cord to charge my phone. The guy wouldn't even take it back from me. He said that I should always keep one with me and I should also start carrying some protection. The cops took a description of the men and the car and asked if I was safe or felt safe. I did, so they left. My phone was charged enough at that point to get an Uber and let my friend know I was still alive. The young men offered me a ride, but had me tell my friend and my husband who I was with. They even showed me their IDs and the car and plate number. On the 10 minute ride, it turned out I was less than 10 city blocks from where I was initially supposed to be. The men were so kind. I kept thanking them and even tried to give them money for helping me. The fake husband one said he just hoped someone would do the same for his sister or his girlfriend if they ever found themselves in the same situation. I laughed a little bit. More like your mom. I'm definitely old enough to be. Sorry you had to fake marry me tonight. He said I was maybe old enough to be his big sister, not his mom, and that my husband was lucky to have such a beautiful wife. They ended up having drinks with me and my friend actually, and their girlfriends came to meet up with us. I told them they had great guys, and thanked them for lending their help to me. We actually all are still friends to this day. I don't even know how to begin this. To be honest, I was only able to puzzle out what happened a few months ago. I guess I'll start from where I believe is the beginning, but I can't assure you this was actually the first time I ever saw him. I'll keep the details pretty vague regarding where this happened so as to not dox myself. I know I have pictures of my face on the internet, but I don't feel comfortable sharing my name or the specific city I lived in at the time. Let's just say it's a European city, very central and cosmopolitan. When I was about 15 years old, I was actually extremely interested in philosophy books. I didn't feel I could talk to my friends about the subject without boring them, though. So, when this man approached me on the street with a pamphlet about Plato classes, I was pretty excited. He was about 28 to 30 years old. Very tall, skinny, those crazy eyes. I remember I was a bit of a smartass and thought that reading two of Plato's most well-known books made me interesting, so we started debating right there in the street. It was a nice conversation actually and lasted about 10 minutes, but it was already getting late, so I decided to leave it at that. The man told me his name at that point, but I honestly cannot remember it. A couple of days later, I met him on the very same street at a totally different time. It was always very crowded, so I wasn't especially spooked about it or anything. I was just getting out of the subway after classes. Mind you, I took this route every day until I graduated high school. I didn't live on that street or anything, but it was where I got out of the subway and then waited for the bus that would take me home. I thought it was a cool coincidence that the philosophy guy was at the subway door. This time, he didn't have any pamphlets. Instead, he had a lollipop in his hand. I know it sounds cliche, but it was so eerie to see a six-foot guy just sucking this lollipop and staring straight at me. He called out hi, I said hi back. He tried to get a conversation going with me, but I could feel this weird energy in the air, so I decided to cut that conversation short. After that, I'd see him once or twice a week. I just assumed he lived there at first and happened to be going for a walk at the same time I was getting home. I honestly believed this weird guy, twice my age, just happened to find his way to me so many times. That is, until I saw him in my neighborhood. I was having coffee with a friend of mine. She was telling me that she'd met this cool guy while playing volleyball on the beach, when that guy, I shit you not, just appeared out of nowhere. He approached my friend and they talked for a bit. Yes, he was the guy she was just talking about. He seemed mildly surprised that the two of us were friends, but didn't seem to give it much thought, so I didn't either. When he left, though, I started feeling really uneasy. My friend thought he was cool, though, so I didn't voice any of my concerns. You see, there's this thing about teenage girls that makes them believe they're very mature for their age, so we assumed he had befriended us separately, then found out we were friends. At the time, none of us had social media apart from WhatsApp, 
so I can't even understand how he managed to insert himself into my friend group. Eventually, my friend left to study abroad and the subject died down. I would see that dude now and then on that same street of my commute, but we would only speak for a few minutes and that was about it. This went on for about six months or so. Sometimes he would try to pretend he didn't know who I was, but would still approach me saying that I looked somewhat familiar. Sometimes he would greet me very warmly like old friends. Looking back, I guess he was dealing with some kind of mental health problem. Slowly though, he began getting a lot bolder. One time he asked for my number and tried to grab me. I could feel that something was very wrong, but at the same time, I thought I must be being the weird one since he seemed like such a nice dude. Still, I gave him a fake number. This other time, we went to a church on a school trip, and I saw him just waiting outside talking to all my peers. He played it cool, saying he had seen my face somewhere but was not sure, as if I hadn't been seeing him everywhere almost every week for a year now. I was very stupid at the time, though. I never even thought about talking to my parents about this. After all, the guy wasn't violent, it's not like he was mean. In my head, he was just a lonely man who happened to have a strangely similar routine to mine. I started to be real scared though. I'd look behind my back when I was alone at night. I'd avoid all dark streets. I was kind of paranoid, but still, I ignored my gut feeling and shoved it to the back of my mind. After all, as long as I just gave him a few minutes of my day when he called out for me, everything would be fine. When I turned 17, I just suddenly stopped seeing him anywhere. I think this went on for about a year. It was quite a relief, honestly. I could sense that what had happened was bizarre, but I'd explain it away to my friends like it was a funny thing, like it was an inside joke. Eventually, I started attending college, so my everyday route changed quite a bit. I stayed in the same city, though. One day, I had to go through that same street once again. I can't remember the exact reason. I just know that I was walking, minding my own business. It was about 9 p.m. at night. I turned around the corner, and there he was. He saw me, smiled, and said he was lost, asked for directions. I swear I felt a primal fear in that moment. I felt like I was truly dealing with an insane person. We had crossed each other's paths for two years straight in this exact same place, and here he was acting as if he didn't know who I was, or where he was. Something about that fucked with my mind for a while. I just kept walking. I didn't even look at him. I didn't utter a single word. All of a sudden, he just lost his shit. For the first time ever, I saw what he really was. He grabbed my arm and screamed I was the biggest bitch ever. He said he hoped my mom would die of cancer. He said he would kill me. I know I was not alone as there were quite a lot of people outside still, but no one said anything. He started screaming in my face. I yanked away and started running. I ran and cried. This was the last time I ever saw him, two years ago. He's long since stopped talking to my friend, but nobody I ask ever knows who he is. I can't remember his name to go to the police and file a report. It's like my mind tried to erase him. He was a stellar stalker though, because I never understood that's what he was until years after the fact. I'm just glad I ended up safe in the end. This story takes place when I was about 13 years old. I'm 19 now if the details are unclear. I just moved into a small countryside town, into a house that was just beside a huge forest. It was a new neighborhood and we didn't really have very many houses on my street. You could, without a doubt, walk hours into the woods and still be going. Being young and stupid, I take my dog on a walk without having my parents with me or taking anything to protect me. I don't even remember taking a cell phone with me. Don't blame my parents for this because they were reassured by the fact that my dog was really big and people were easily frightened by him. Like, really easily. My dog was about seven at the time. I did that often, nothing bad ever happening, and I never met anyone out on those walks either. 
I really loved doing this because I could just take my mind off everything else that was happening in my life. The moving was rough on me, and to make everything more fun, I was being bullied at school too, so I really needed this time alone. There I was, casually walking on a track that's supposed to be used if you have a motocross or a quad. I heard a noise that I didn't pay too much attention to at first. It was coming from right behind me and started to become steadily louder. When I turned back to see what it was, I could see a person coming straight at me on his motorcycle. I was a 13-year-old girl who was scared of everything that seemed out of the ordinary, so I decided to hop off the track and hide as quickly as I could. Unfortunately for me, though, Henry was black and did not blend in with the surroundings very well. After all, everything was green and it was the middle of the day, too. I walked pretty fast, but I could tell the bike was getting closer and I was pretty obviously standing out. I started running until I finally found a rock that was big enough to hide both my dog and I. I heard the motocross come and go. It was impossible for the person to see us now, really. I waited there, telling myself I was just being silly. When I thought I had waited long enough for the person to have gone wherever they were going, I started to walk again, laughing at myself. I froze instantly, though, when I heard a loud engine becoming suddenly so close to me. Without hesitation, I started running like hell. When I was able to find a better spot to stop and hide, I did. My dog wasn't in the best shape since he was so old, and I was feeling bad for making him run that much. I could tell that person was still following me and getting closer, too. It wasn't exactly a dense forest, so he could follow along the path. He was so much faster than me. I'm a clumsy person, so I trip on just about everything I can. In the middle of while I was running, I met this lovely branch and fell to the ground pretty hard after tripping on it. I was so full of adrenaline, though, that I hopped up and started running again. The man was now meters from me. He could see me clearly and was also chasing me. There was no doubt in my mind that if he grabbed me, something really bad was about to happen to me. We were approaching a more dense part of the forest, though. So at this point, the guy had no choice but to stop his bike. This gave me an advantage on him, and I was able to slip away into the forest. I was so glad when I finally saw a house. It was under construction still, so nobody lived in it yet. I did find a hiding spot behind the fence. Minutes later, I saw that motorcycle person come so close to me, but I could tell he didn't see where I had gone. I felt a huge sense of relief when he started to go the wrong direction. I think I hid for about 30 to 40 minutes without even moving to make sure he was really gone this time. I found my way home and told my parents all about it, but they thought I was just being dramatic. In the end, I still never knew who this person was. I did hurt myself by tripping a lot, but it was nothing too serious. I heard years later about weed that was being grown in a part of the woods and cameras. Maybe I'd come too close to their operation and they saw me on those cameras or something. I also went with friends of mine when I was older and found this small abandoned house that was not too far from where this happened. This happened in July of 2016. Please note, it's kind of a long post. I had recently moved from Adelaide to Melbourne to live with my boyfriend who's now my husband in a shared house unit with one of his friends and his friend's girlfriend. I'll call her Nikita for this story, as she was also involved. My boyfriend and his friend were at work. Nikita and I were at home. This was in a small two-story bedroom unit in a beautiful family-friendly suburb, quite close to the local shopping mall actually. We loved our neighbors, the street, and the area in general, and we'd never had any issues prior to this. Both the bedrooms were upstairs. Nikita was sleeping in that day, and I had just made my way downstairs into our kitchen slash lounge room. This was also the main room of the unit, with the front door, back door, and garage door on different walls of the room. It all happened at around 10 a.m. I can't explain how quickly the following events occurred, but it was very sudden. 
I was standing at the sink about to fill the kettle up when I heard the garage door suddenly open. My first thought was that it must be Nikita in the garage. We smoked out there sometimes and not in the house. I walked around the fridge to greet her, but no more than two meters in front of me was some man rushing into the room. He yelled out, What the fuck is going on? We later laughed about this, saying we should have been the ones asking him that. I only had a split second to process what was happening and register his face before turning and running for my best escape route, which in my mind was the stairs. The front door was a bit closer, but it was dead bolted shut, and Nikita was still upstairs sleeping. There was no way I was just going to leave her there alone. I ran as fast as I could, almost tripping over myself, and the steps, as my legs felt like concrete jelly, if you can imagine what that feels like. As I reached the top of the stairs and Nikita's bedroom door, I burst into her room, slammed it shut, and leaned against it, chest heaving heavily. I yelled for her to wake up. Nikita, where's your phone? Wake up, there's a man in the house! I half screamed and half cried. She sat up groggily, asking, What? There's a man in the house! Where's your phone? Her eyes widened in terror as she saw me against the door. This door had no lock. I heard nothing and figured we could make it to the bathroom at least, which did have a lock. It was opposite to her bedroom. The bathroom, now! We didn't even question it, just threw her door open and dashed into the next room. As I dialed the police, we heard heavy footsteps coming up the wooden stairs. By now, we were both hysterical. I was begging the operator to send someone immediately, as the guy was coming to find us. He must have heard us on the phone with the cops, because after a brief pause, we heard hurried thumping down the steps once more. The cops were there within two minutes, as they had only been about three streets away. We heard the sirens, and the operator told us the police were there, and it was now safe to come out. They didn't find the guy in the end. I give a full description as best as I could from the brief glimpse I caught. I was even asked to go to the police station to help construct an image to identify him. He was not much taller than me, around 5 foot 4, I'm guessing mid 40s, bald in the middle with shaved hair around the sides of his head. He also wore these wire framed glasses and had a stubby goatee and dark beady eyes. I didn't get a good look at his pants though. The scariest details came later. We realized the guy hadn't actually stolen anything. There were many easily accessible items he could have taken in a hurry with him. Our laptop, my phone, nothing was taken from the garage either. Another thing, there was no sign of forced entry. The garage door to the house can only be accessed from inside the house or the garage. He had opened the electric roller shutter to the garage, then entered the house via the door. That roller shutter could only be opened from the inside manually or from outside with a remote control, which my boyfriend and his friend were never given when they had moved in six months prior. I showed the identity sketch to our neighbors to alert them, and a group of women next door said he looked 99% like the previous tenant of our unit. We notified the police, as well as giving the names of three different people's mail who were still being delivered to our address. We also told our house agents, we checked the lease agreement, which stated the house keys and garage remote control were to be included. Only the keys were signed for. The remote control had been missing. Scarier still, a week or so later, some detectives came to the door to ask if I'd seen or heard anything more after. I told them no. They handed me their card and left. I learned they were investigating sexual predators. I felt sick knowing that. I told Nikita and our neighbors. We all kept a close eye on things, but nothing more came of it after, thankfully. I still wonder if they ever really caught the guy in the end before he threatened anyone else. I am an avid cosplayer, and in 2015, my friends Ari and Morgan and I went for the second year in a row to Phoenix Comic Con. I was cosplaying Stevani from Steven Universe, which consists of a crop top and shorts, 
Ari was cosplaying Black Rock Shooter, a bikini top, shorts, a jacket, and pigtails. Morgan decided not to cosplay that time, since this was her first time going to the con and all. We were all underage and couldn't drive ourselves, so we took the transit home at the end of each day. We left the con around 9 o'clock that night and hopped on the transit. It was surprisingly empty, a lot emptier than usual, that much for sure at least. We found our seats when the door opened. Morgan and I sat down, but Ari's back was having problems, and she decided that standing was for the best. Everything was alright, up until the second stop. It was a quiet ride, actually. We laughed a bit at some of the events of the day, but nothing more than some small talk. We were all pretty exhausted from walking around quite literally all day. At the next stop, a slightly older man got on and sat right next to where Ari was standing. He had this longer blonde hair and was very clean shaven. He also wore a suit jacket and t-shirts with slacks. He didn't look at all like the typical homeless Phoenix rider. Hey, you girls coming back from that convention? He asked. I nodded. Ari looked slightly uncomfortable, as she doesn't do well with initiating conversation with people she doesn't know, especially in the type of outfit she was wearing. I like your costumes. We all smiled and thanked him nervously. We weren't strangers to the kind of people that hung around the Phoenix transit area and how gross and irritating they could be, but this guy not only looked well off, but also spoke very clearly. Still, he threw me off quite a bit. I didn't like that grin he had sprawled across his face as he complimented our cosplays. It was at this point that Morgan put in her headphones and was luckily zoned out for the whole ordeal. Morgan was one of my friend's little sisters who had wanted to go with us. My friend wasn't able to go in the end, so her parents let us watch her while she was there. She was only a freshman, not too much younger than us, but young enough to still need supervision. This also made me feel very protective of her, and this guy was giving me some bad vibes. The man was quiet though, until the next stop. Do you girls mind if I pray over you? Uh... Before we could actually give an answer, he grabbed Ari's arm in my hand, eyes closed tight. We both looked at each other with panic in our eyes, frozen with terror. We didn't want to pull away for fear of making sudden movements. His grip felt so firm, it was like he was actually trying to break my fingers with his hand. Dear Heavenly Father, he began, I pray you look over these angels of light and give them many blessings in life. At first, Ari and I sort of relaxed. Maybe he was just a preacher from a nearby church trying to do a random act of kindness or something. But then, things took a horrifying turn. I pray you subdue their souls to your servant, Father, so that I may enjoy them as you intended. What? He ended the prayer with an amen and finally let us go. Ari desperately wanted to put her jacket on to cover herself, but she still couldn't move. What can we do? I thought to myself, we obviously have to get off now. You know, God's telling me some amazing things about you girls. He almost chuckled. Uh, pardon me? He proceeded to put his hand on my leg and Ari's arm. He's telling me he sent you here for me. I knew you would come. Neither of us could say anything. His voice was this terrifying hissing whisper and we were visibly scared. God is telling me it's time to have my way with you, to solidify the end of the reptilian reign. This man was no preacher. He was a psychopath. We had to get off as soon as possible, and the next stop was a minute and a half away. I knew there was a strip mall there. We could get off and head into one of the stores. One of them had to be open. His grip on my leg tightened uncomfortably as the next stop pulled into view. So hard, in fact, that it left a bruise of his fingers the next day, and I don't bruise easily. Come on, my light angels. Get off with me. The train stopped. Actually, I said, this is our stop. I stood up and jerked my leg away. He obviously wasn't prepared for that because his hand slipped right off. I poked Morgan to attention and told her to come on, hoping she wouldn't say anything about this not actually being our stop. To my relief, though, she followed without question. We walked briskly off the train and jogged into the mall, where we found a nearby subway. 
They let us stay there while we called Ari's parents and explained what happened. As soon as we got off the phone, Ari and I burst into tears as we told Morgan everything. I'm still terrified of riding the transit, and I try my best to get home from the convention any other way. There was no telling what would have happened if we rode the train any further with that guy, and I don't like to think about the possible outcomes. This happened in early 2016, when I was living with my mom and stepdad and two adopted sisters. I was 19 at the time, male, and for a little bit of backstory, my job at the time was doing security work in different parts of a West Coast metropolitan city. At the time, we were leasing a three-bedroom home with a giant living room. One of the bathrooms barely fit one person, though, and had a small window. Included inside was this metal wire shelf thing that holds all of my stuff like gel, toothbrush, razor, etc. My neighbors would hardly ever speak to each other and would never be home either. I would always assume they'd be at work or something. This will be important. This event occurred when I had just gotten off work from doing a 12-hour graveyard shift, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Of course, I was tired as all hell, so I quickly drove home said hi to my mom while she made breakfast, and slumped my way to my room. I knocked out without even taking my uniform off, a black polo, tactical pants, and tactical boots. I didn't even get to close the door to my room. That's how dead tired I was. Now, every day, my mom and stepdad left to work along with my sisters, who needed to head off to school at around 7 a.m. That's usually when I had my freedom to play my PS4 and stuff, and yell at strangers or friends through the mic and whatnot. This morning, though, I decided it best to just catch up on my sleep. I half sleepily awoke to a series of hard, fast knocks on our wooden door. Mistake number one. I ignored it. I thought maybe it was a salesman or one of those door-to-door -door religious people. Sometimes, my stepdad also came home to get lunch, but he has a key to the house. No worries, I thought. I quickly fell back asleep. I again awoke to the sudden sounds of loud footsteps running on the wooden floor towards the door, and the door slamming shut as loud as it possibly could. Mistake number two. Okay, it must have been my stepdad running late to work after his lunch break or something. No biggie. After my slumber, everybody came back home and started preparing for dinner while I hopped on some PS4. My mom came to me with a very serious look on her face. Hey, did someone break into the house or something? Did you leave any time today? No, why? I was just sleeping until everyone came back. Okay, well, come look at this. My mom took me to the little bathroom from the earlier description. I looked up at the little window, cold air breezing through a broken frame and broken hinges. I looked at the metal wire shelf. It was a dent on the top, as if someone had bent it with their weight while climbing in. I felt my spine tingle as it hadn't really hit me at that moment yet. I thought back to what I heard while I was asleep. You know, I did hear someone knocking earlier. I heard stepdad come to get something before leaving in a rush and slamming the door. Son, your stepdad didn't go to the house today. My throat clenched and dropped to my stomach. My fingertips felt as if they had been frozen. It felt as if my body was sinking into a deep, dark abyss in the ocean. I couldn't even say anything. We stared at each other for what felt like an eternity. We started checking the whole house to see if anything had been taken. Nothing. Everything was exactly as it was. We asked a few neighbors if they had seen anything, but turned out they weren't home as usual. We gave the local PD a tip just to let them know. They already had knowledge of this. That person was still out there. My mind kept racing. What exactly happened? Why didn't this person take anything? Why did this mystery burglar decide to just run off? We came to the conclusion that this person knocked first to see if anyone was home, but seeing as I didn't answer, they thought nobody was and stepped into our house. Since I snore really loudly, this person might have thought there was a dog inside the house or something. Another possibility would be that they saw someone in a uniform sleeping and didn't want to mess with me. There are many possibilities that could have unfolded, it's clear what the burglar's intentions were, I guess, just to grab everything valuable and leave. But 
What if it was a maniac stepping into my house with intentions other than stealing? The thought of someone watching me in my sleep from about five feet away gets me anxious no matter where I am. This event made me realize that no matter who you are, you'll always be vulnerable when you aren't alert of your surroundings. Now, I'm a 5'11 guy and an average build dude. It's safe to say I could have held my own against someone trying to break in. But even if you're armed to the teeth, you never know when someone will be watching you and planning something ill-mannered, and all you can do is react. There are things and people out there that have been shielded away from most of us, especially in this day and age. You never know who you might walk past when you're walking down the street. When I was in my preteen years, my parents would take me annually to a pretty large anime convention close to where I live. I still attend it some years when I can afford it, but back then anime was one of my main interests, and many of my friends would also go there to meet up. I would always practically beg my parents to buy me tickets. One of the first years that I attended, probably 2005 or 2006, I attended the Masquerade. It was a show they put on where people in various costumes would put on skits or performances related to their favorite series. It was mildly entertaining. It was actually a good late night event to go to when you didn't quite feel like leaving the convention yet on a Saturday night. A few months after the convention, I was walking around with my parents at my local Walmart when a large, tall, older man approached me from the cleaning aisle suddenly. Note that I was so young, when I say older, I don't mean he was middle-aged or anything, just in comparison to me. I was like maybe 10 or 12 at the time. He was clearly already in his mid-twenties. He came a little bit too close to me, and I could see the fresh sweat stains forming on his shirt. He held his hands close to his chest and looked at me in a way that set off alarms even at that young age. Hey, were you at the convention? He asked me with an exaggerated eagerness in his voice. I nervously confirmed that I was in fact there. You know, I saw you. I saw you there at the masquerade. I was Link. I was playing the ocarina on stage. You were wearing these white cat ears on a bonnet. I pretended to remember him to be polite, but to be honest, that wasn't exactly a unique act. A few people had showed up on stage dressed as Link from The Legend of Zelda and played songs on his iconic ocarina. Him remembering me, though, shocked me and made me feel somewhat unsafe. I wasn't terribly far away from the stage, and while it's common for many girls to go around the convention wearing some form of animal ears, very few of them had a bonnet like I did. He nearly pleaded with me to give him some way for him to contact me. I tried to rationalize with myself that maybe he was a nice person. Maybe I was just uncomfortable because I was shy. This is an attitude that has since gotten me into trouble a few times in my life, and it's taken me a long time to get rid of it. Plus, I mean, my parents were right there beside me. They would have said something if they saw him as a threat, right? I decided to give him my aim handle, because people were still using that back then. He couldn't really get other information about me through it either. As he left, he went over to my mother. Ma'am, you have a very cute daughter. In a voice that made me immediately regret not giving him a fake username. For whatever reason, my mom teased me about this, as if she thought that man's behavior was cute and acceptable, or supposed to make me feel good about myself or something. I saw him all around a few more times before we left the store. I got the distinct impression after a while that he was following me from a distance, smiling and waving every time I caught him. After a bit of this, I just kept my head down until we were in the car. When I got home, he had already messaged me a couple of times. We talked a bit, but he started making not-so-subtle remarks about how he'd never had a girlfriend before. I decided to log off then. For literal months after that, he would message me nearly every day, never seeming to pick up the hint that I wasn't responding, until I eventually had to get a new username altogether. This happened a few weeks ago. I recently graduated from college with a degree in biology, but decided to take a minute for myself before applying to medical school after. My school was in a dangerous area. 
I still rent in the area because my roommate is a master's student at the same university. We live about five blocks off campus, on a street where you wouldn't want to be caught alone at night. One day, I was by myself in our apartment jamming out to some tunes when I heard a sudden banging on the door. This was odd to me because my apartment is a row home style apartment with two others below me and a front door, which I had most certainly locked behind me when I'd entered the building 10 minutes prior. It was also additionally concerning because I'm a five foot tall woman and currently alone. Since we live on the top floor, nobody but my roommate and I were ever up on the third floor, and I had not recently submitted a maintenance request or anything. I turned off the music for a moment and sat still, waiting to see if it happened again. The banging soon started once more. Now I recognized that this was stupid, but I walked to the front door, opened it the tiniest crack, to see a large, dirty, heavy-set man with a beard on the other side. Um, can I help you with something? He looked me dead in the eye and said this. I'm here to fix the air conditioning leak, ma'am. You need to let me inside the apartment so I can make repairs. My management company only has one regular maintenance worker who I was very familiar with. I had never seen the man standing at my door previously. He took a step forward while I quickly said, wrong place, and slammed the locked door in his face. Initially, I actually wasn't too concerned. Maybe he really was just in the wrong place. I emailed my landlord to ask about maintenance reps in the area. She replied with this. The company had an HVAC technician out today, but none to your address. What did he look like? After describing him as a large, heavier white man with a full beard, she responded, That was not our HVAC rep. He's a small, thin man. I'm not sure who the hell that was. Now I'm worried about my safety, because clearly someone has the keys to our building, and even my management company can't account for who he may have been. They also refused to change the front door lock, so I'm kind of on my own with this one. I'm an art student looking to become an animator in the gaming or film industries. One of my teachers suggested I apply to be a student volunteer at SIGGRAPH this year, since it was being held in our city. I applied, but I didn't actually think I'd get in. Well, color me surprised when just a few months later, I got an email back, welcoming me to the ACM SIGGRAPH family and detailing what I could expect as an SV. I was so happy. This was a huge opportunity for me. I would get to meet all kinds of students just like me from around the globe and get the chance to mingle with professionals in my chosen industries. Just think of the contacts I could and did make. I even got a full conference pass and didn't have to pay a dime. So worth it. As a whole, the convention was really awesome and I did meet a lot of great people, both students and industry vets. I got to see some really cool emerging technology too, learn from a lot of informative technical paper sessions, and see sneak peeks of upcoming movies even. It was my last day that I was working at the convention. I had one of the early shifts so I had to get there very early in the morning. It was 7am or so and I was walking toward the convention center with my coffee in hand. I was wearing my SV shirt because my shift started at 7.30. We were told shirt equals working, so if you're wearing it and someone approaches you, you have to be polite and helpful. As I was walking up the steps, this middle-aged balding man approached me. He had the lanyard around his neck which signified him as a convention attendee. He called out to me, so I stopped and politely greeted him. It started off innocently enough, asking questions about the convention, asking what the must-see things were in my opinion, general information that I was very happy to provide. Then he started asking more personal questions. Was I from here? Where did I go to school? What was I studying? Etc. My badge had my name printed on it. He complimented me for having a beautiful name and told me it matched my face as well. I was a bit uncomfortable, but I thanked him for the compliment and went around to just leave. He moved himself right in front of me and got a bit too close for comfort. He was smiling lopsidedly, nicotine-stained teeth right in front of my nose. 
You know what I love about these conventions? He leaned in and asked. No? What? What happens at a convention stays at a convention, you know. Don't you think it's exciting to lead a secret life apart from your husband or wife? My skin started crawling. I had mentioned I was married when he was asking his questions about me, so I was really skeeved out. That's not really my thing. He grabbed onto my arm and started rubbing it up and down. Why don't you come walk with me for a while? I recoiled like his hand was made of molten metal. His smile instantly transitioned into a look of contempt. You know, I have a shift to do, so enjoy your time at SIGGRAPH. I booked it out of there. I was really shaken. I told one of the girls I was working with what had happened. She told me that at one of the industry parties the night before, a bunch of the SVs had gone together and were dancing. A large group of old men leered at them, hollered and catcalled, asked them to dance on the tables even. I don't know why I was so surprised by that. The attendees were overwhelmingly men from all different parts of the world and industries that are involved to SIGGRAPH tend to cater to the more, shall we say, socially awkward type of person. Still, it creeped me right the hell out. This happened in my very first year at uni, Australia. I was moving out of home for the first time, and I think this made me very, very naive in this situation. Twenty and female, by the way. I found a cheap place in the city near my workplace at the time. 150 PW for a room in a share house only about 20 minutes out from the CBD. It seemed like an awesome deal to me. I messaged the landlord and told her I was very interested. Before she gave me the time to come and inspect the place, she seemed overly interested in my ethnic background. I'm half Ethiopian, so I definitely don't look white. But when I told her I'm Australian, she suddenly became very withdrawn. I thought it was a bit strange. Maybe she thought I was lying because she had seen my profile photo on flatmates.com, so I explained my background. She seemed satisfied with my answer, and we organized a time for me to come see the room. I'll call the landlord Denise. Denise showed me around and talked as if the place was already mine, which I thought was very exciting. It was a main house with five bedrooms, a caravan on the side, and a granny flat behind it with three bedrooms. This is where I would be moving in. The main room and caravan were full, seven people living there, but only one of the rooms in the granny flat was occupied. It was nice enough considering the situation, and very clean. A weekly cleaner was included in the rent price actually, as well as weekly maintenance. I didn't think to ask about what that meant, because I was already pretty set on moving in. I met all of the people who would go on to be my housemates. All of them were foreigners, mostly Chinese or South Korean, who had come to study. I still didn't find this odd, I mean, there were plenty of international students here. The door to my room had a lock on it, and I was told only myself and Denise had a key. But Denise never came to the house anyway, so there was a nice level of privacy. A little after a week after I'd moved in, I met the maintenance guy finally. I'll call him Patrick. He seemed to be gardening when he came over to introduce himself. He seemed nice enough. I found out he was actually Denise's brother. He looked to be in his late 40s or so. I found him a bit awkward, but I'd been raised to be polite to a fault so I ended up talking to him for a long time before going back to my room. I don't remember exactly what we talked about, but I remember he kept saying things like I was very beautiful, describing my skin as exotic, and even caramel more than once. This all just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. A few days later, the cleaner comes also. She was super lovely, and had apparently known Denise and Patrick for a long time. She and I had a nice chat, for some reason, she suddenly brought up that Patrick was on the autistic spectrum, so to me, that explained his awkwardness. I realized he was somewhat harmless, so I felt bad about my initial judgments of him. The next time I saw him, I came out into the kitchen and saw him just standing there. This struck me as odd. One, it was the morning, and I was in my pajamas having just woken up. Two, he's the maintenance guy. Why would he just be standing inside? I felt bad, so I smiled and said hello. 
He turned around and seemed extremely startled to see me, but explained to me he was just taking out the trash. I saw that he really had replaced the bins in the kitchen, so I was just like, oh, okay, he was just trying to be nice, I guess. I told him he really didn't have to do that from now on. He kind of insisted, though. I just said, eh, whatever, all right. I ended up talking to him again. He seemed to have this really weird fixation on me being exotic, even though I told him I had been born in Australia. Mostly, though, he was generally just asking how I was finding the place. He kept reiterating that everything was super safe, and for some reason brought up the keys to the bedrooms. He let loose that only me, Denise, and him had the keys. I didn't say anything out loud, but in my head I thought, wait, since when does he have a key too? I still kind of brushed it off though. Cut to a few months later. I work about four to six days a week, casual, as well as going to uni four days. I'm rarely there during the day and lock my bedroom door before leaving every day. I don't remember exactly what time of year this would have been, but I know it was on the colder side and I hadn't used the ceiling fan in my room for a while. But when I got home from a long day and unlocked my bedroom door, I noticed the ceiling fan was odd. This struck me immediately. I knew I hadn't turned it on in forever. I was very, very confused and thought I must have turned it on while leaving by accident and maybe just didn't remember. I brought it up with my roommate and she just kind of shrugged and said that's odd, but she didn't seem too weirded out by it. I figured I must have been overthinking. Note, I kept to myself a lot. I wasn't close to any of my roommates and only talked to this woman occasionally. A few weeks later, I'm leaving for work, and I have a very strange feeling while walking to the front gate of the house. For some reason, I turned around, and I saw Patrick hiding in the bushes, staring at me. As soon as he was caught, he turned around and pretended to be gardening. In the moment, my mind actually went kind of blank. Surely, he couldn't just be openly watching me like that. All I could do was frown and wonder to myself why he would be staring at me then pretend he hadn't been. I came back later in the day and immediately as I walked in, I could feel that something was off, but this time I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. I stand in my room looking around, staring at everything in the room, but I couldn't find anything. When I realized that I didn't know what I was looking for, I felt creeped out and left and told my roommate again that I thought someone had been in my room. This time, she sat down with me and said she thought someone had been in her room recently too. We chatted and she said that she had left her bedroom window open when she went to work. When she came home, it was closed tight. I brought up the fan incident once more. My roommate said maybe we should let Denise know about all of this. I texted her and said something along the lines of, I think someone's been going into my room because of X and X event. My roommate said the same thing. I exchanged a few messages with Denise, but the general response was something like, Oh wow, that's so bizarre. Again, being super naive, young, and too polite for my own good, I assumed I must be overreacting. I didn't want to come off as a bad tenant and get kicked out or something. Thankfully, it turned out Denise was more sympathetic than I realized, I guess, because she said she was going to have the locks changed the very next day. I was like, yeah, thanks. I assumed that would be it. In my head, though, I was thinking, only three people have the keys. Me, Denise, and Patrick. So if someone had been coming in, wouldn't it have have to been one of us three? Which is why I immediately didn't feel good when Patrick showed up the next day to change the lock personally himself, being the maintenance guy and all. I ended up leaving while he did the change. Got a text later saying it was done and new keys were in the mailbox. Fast forward and I had now been at this place for nearly a year. By now I was aware that Patrick seemed to come over about twice a week. He always came inside to take out the rubbish but never really seemed to do any maintenance work that I could notice. I chalked it up to nepotism. Maybe Denise gave him a job because he couldn't find one elsewhere. I just tried my best to avoid him. As far as I remember, nothing else strange had happened until now. I came home from work again and walked into my bedroom. While I'm getting my clothes to shower, I noticed something very, very strange that was definitely not there when I had left. There was some whitish, pale gunk kind of splattered upwards on the wall and the floor. 
Honestly, my first thought after looking at it was, looks kind of like donut glaze or something. I leaned closer to it, but still didn't really register what it was, only that I definitely have not left anything like that there at all. I got creeped out. I went to the kitchen to grab a chucks to wipe it up, when I had a thought. Wait, is that semen? I really didn't know what to look for, but as soon as I had that thought, nothing could convince me otherwise. Again, my door had been locked shut. Only myself, Denise, and Patrick had keys. My roommate wasn't home, but I called Denise right away. She didn't answer, so instead I messaged her and said basically, someone had been in my room and there was some weird stuff splattered on the wall. I wanted to see if she'd come to the same conclusion I did. Her response this time was so off. She messaged me back hours later and was immediately dismissive. Very bizarre. I changed the locks yesterday though. Yeah, obviously. So who do you think it could have been? I felt so weird and grossed out that I went to a friend's place and messaged my stepdad about it. I told him everything for the first time. I guess it sounds a lot worse all at once because his response was immediate anger and telling me I was moving out right then and there. I called Denise and told her I was going to go if the issue wasn't taken seriously. This is when I realized that the leasing situation at this place was extremely dodgy, which I couldn't have known beforehand due to lack of experience and not having anyone to ask. Essentially, there was no record of me actually being a tenant. I was just kind of sending money to this lady's bank account, but there wasn't any official paperwork. I looked back over some of the stuff I'd signed when I initially moved in. It was typed up by Denise, I assume. I don't remember the details, but it was some super sketch stuff. I'm glad I was able to move out ASAP. Denise didn't put up a fuss about the short notice. When I came back the next day, the stuff on the wall was gone, so I had no proof of what happened. But that just kind of confirmed to me that something weird was going on with Denise and Patrick. My stepdad helped me move out all my stuff. Denise just left a message saying to please leave the keys on the counter. It took me a few weeks to process every creepy thing that happened throughout my stay and put it all together as a massive creep fest. My roommate left not long after. Months later, she messaged me to say that one of the old housemates told her police were called to the place. I don't know why or what happened, but I suspect it was not exactly for the tenants. I used to live in a townhouse slash duplex by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who park outside my place and pass by through the day and night. Occasionally I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my veranda. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door, telling me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun, but none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors, and I would take him out for a last wee before bed. My backyard light was broken, and was up too high to change the bulb, so I always took him out front instead. That night, it was around 11pm, and I took him out to go pee. It was a hot summer night. I was mindlessly standing on the footpath, when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared, and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to ponder on it. Where he came from was outside a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there currently and thought maybe he was trying to steal things. I kept looking down the road to where he had just gone. He turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching. Then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still there outside. This gave me the absolute creeps, so I immediately grabbed my dog and headed inside. I turned off all my lights and went upstairs to my bedroom, which was at the front of the townhouse and faced out to the street. I thought I would keep watch of my neighbor's house and call the police if the man came back. I peered through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. Like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He is moving towards the house across the road when I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscured my view for a moment. Then he's there once more. Not just there. He stopped at the top of my driveway, standing there like Jason Voorhees. I kid you not, 
His arms were out by his sides, and his legs apart in this unnatural stance, like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to come kill me. My heart was racing so hard I could barely even hear. I was standing there slack-jawed, looking at this would-be assailant, when one of my cats came out to see what was happening. My cat slid his body between the blinds and window, further opening it. I see this person, this man, staring up directly at me. I thought for sure he saw me. If he did, that did not stop him at all. He started walking down my driveway, undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes were watering in fear, and tears were streaming down my face. I had no idea what to do. I went to sit on my bed. I picked up my mobile and dialed my dad, who lived a suburb away. He answered. I whispered everything that was happening to him, and he said he would be there as soon as he could. I lied down in my bed and tried to be as still as I could. Tears were rolling down my cheeks. Pure fear. Not knowing what this man was doing downstairs, and if he could get in. I couldn't even remember if I'd locked the doors when I went back inside. Then it dawned on me. Why am I just lying here in the dark by myself crying? Turn a light on. So I did. After what seemed like a lifetime, but was probably only a couple of minutes later, my dad finally arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia, so no guns, but I guess he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. He was gone. Maybe me turning on the light had scared him off. I called the police who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have. I really don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog too, but they couldn't find any sign of him. I don't know what that man wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared living there. I'm still scaredy cat, but reading other stories makes me realize I'm not alone, and we can all learn from these experiences. So we, I, know what to do if something scary like that happens again. So, this is a story from several years ago, but I remember it clear as day. A long time ago, I was an addict. Thirteen years old and lost. I was relying financially and emotionally on much older, thirty to forty year old men. It was a mess looking back at it now. It was clear I was being groomed. There was this one guy named Turner. He had two kids, aged three and five. They were beautiful little people, and honestly, the only light in my otherwise dark and depressing life. Turner was a crack addict, and fueled me with ounces upon ounces of cocaine, MCAT, and MDMA. I kind of took on the big sister role, and made sure the kids got to school okay and were fed, whilst Turner sat half-conscious on the bedroom floor usually with a needle or pipe in his hand. Turner let me stay there. I'd stay seven days a week. My dad had just died, and I essentially had nobody to care about my whereabouts. So that was my life. Constantly high. But I loved those kids. Oh, and their dog, too. Tess, the dog, was a staffy cross pit bull. Vicious as hell couldn't be walked because she'd rip the throat out of any passing dog or child. Truly a vicious dog. But she was damaged. So badly abused by all the druggies who came in and out of this house. Approximately ten people, including myself, lived in this house with the kids and Turner. She would wee herself any time someone approached her out of pure fear. But for some reason, she loved me. She'd even go for walks at night with me and behave like a good girl and would snuggle on the sofa with me each night. I never let her around the kids, though. Me and the kids got close, and Turner kind of handed all responsibility over to myself. I didn't mind because, like I said, it gave me something to wake up for each day. I shielded them as much as I could, and when I was being sexually abused, it was often to save one of them from the old perverts that were trying to harm them. It was a shitty situation, but I honestly loved them. I know that sounds like pointless rambling, but it's necessary to understand the story I'm about to tell. 
One night, Turner and the lads went to another house to take part in a big journey to gather more drugs in time for a rave nearby. Turner left me with a bowl full of cocaine and the kids, so naturally I got high as fuck. I cooked the kids their tea, got them in bed, and walked Tess. I found myself self-harming in the kitchen, feeling completely lost and terrified at what my life had become. I had used a piece of broken glass and then tossed it into the garden outside. Stupid, I know. I let Tess out for a wee and heard her yelping, so I ran to her. Her paw was bleeding. It was really bad. I realized she'd stood on the glass I threw out of the window, and I burst into tears, scooped Tess up, and ran to the bathroom. The bathroom was massive. Next door, beside the bedroom, was yet another bathroom. I lay in the bath with Tess on my lap and sprayed her paw with water, trying to see if the glass was still there. I lay in the bath for a good half hour crying and apologizing to the dog like some crazy woman. Tess seemed to relax, and I got a bandage and wrapped her paw before calling Turner, saying she'd need to go to the vet. He refused, of course. I then heard the girl, the oldest child, talking in her bedroom. I went to the door and could hear very faint chatter. I assumed that she was just playing pretend or whatever kids do, and I walked away. Tess was now walking, while limping, but wouldn't budge from the kid's door. I tried pulling her away, but she just stood growling at the door. I couldn't get into the kid's room for fear of Tess running in and attacking. I tried to bait the dog away with treats, but to no avail. But then I heard it. A man's voice, clear as anything. I couldn't make out the words, but it was definitely not a child's voice. I realize now why Tess was being so defensive. I picked her up and locked her in the big bathroom we were just in. Then I went back to the kid's door with no real clue as to what I was going to do. I swung the door open, but the room was empty besides the kids. The girl was sat at the end of the bed. I asked who she had been talking to, and she just said, That man. I asked which man, and she pointed to the slightly open bathroom door. I told her to lie back in bed and relax, and slowly made my way to the door. As I did, the door swung open, and there he was, all six foot plus of him, a huge guy with a beard and crazed eyes. I don't know why, but I pushed him by his chest further into the bathroom, and then turned to run towards the kids. The girl was looking at me shocked. As I ran towards them, he grabbed me from behind and got me in a choker hold of sorts, and told me not to move. I had been sexually assaulted, beaten and branded by these men, but for some reason, this time, I feared for my life more than ever before. I noticed a knife in his left hand, raised in next to my side. He told the kids to lock themselves in the large wardrobe in the living room. As I said, lots of people lived here, many of which slept in the living room as it was huge. And they did. I told them it would be okay, but the truth was it wasn't. He sat me on the sofa and began to draw the knife across my skin, almost playfully. I was too scared to speak. At this point, my friend walked in. Another young girl, around 18 years old. She stayed here too, sometimes. The way the house was laid out meant that as soon as she entered, she could see me sat on the sofa but not the man. I tried with my eyes to show her that something was wrong, but she confidently walked in. The man was startled by her entry, as was she by him. He told her to sit on the sofa, but she was a feisty one. She ran at him, assuming he was just some druggy idiot, screaming at him to get out or so-and-so would kick his head in. Before she finished her sentence, he punched her square in the jaw, her falling to the floor. I jumped out of reflex, and he stabbed me in the side of my left arm. Then he said, You sit the fuck back down, or I'll do the same to you. When she tried to sit back up, he kicked her in the face and continued beating her. He was slapping, 
punching, biting, even ripped her earrings out, tearing her lobes. By a few minutes in, she was unconscious, and I sat there like a fucking coward. Once unconscious, he threw her to the side like she weighed nothing, and looked back at me. He took both of my hands and tied them together with duct tape, and told me to shut the fuck up. And then he started to approach the wardrobe the kids were in. I started to scream at them to run, but as soon as it was open, he had them. They were kicking and screaming, and he threw the boy onto the floor, causing him to hit his head. He then went into the bedroom with the girl telling me to stay with the boy and not dare try anything, or he'd make that cut deeper. I felt helpless, and I did the only thing I could think to do. I ran into the big bathroom and let Tess free. I pushed the bedroom door open and watched as Tess jumped on this man, ripping him to fucking pieces. He was stabbing Tess and the girl was crying, but Tess just kept going. I ran in and got the girl then got the boy and pushed them out the front door. They live deep in the country, good for growing weed and selling drugs, and so I told them to hide behind the huge van on the field. I went back in, and it was like a horror movie. Blood up the walls, flesh on the floor. It was amazingly horrific. Tess was still mauling this man, and he'd given up fighting. His lower leg was shredded to meat, I grabbed Tess and dragged her off. She had tired herself out and had less power at that point. The man was unconscious. I took Tess out of the room and saw she'd been stabbed at least six times, mainly across her back. As the adrenaline wore off, she got weaker. I held her in my arms as she died, and I've never cried that much before or since. I remember telling her, You're a good girl, Tess. I'm sorry they made you bad. I'm sorry they hurt you. I love you. And I really did. Tess and those kids gave me purpose. I held her for a while and watched her take her last breaths. I put her in the bath, covered her in blankets, and went for the kids. As I left the house, Turner had arrived back with the lads and they looked at me, covered in blood looking like a murderer, and looked at the kids. Turner came running at me asking what I'd done, probably assuming I'd had a huge trip and hurt someone. I couldn't talk and I just carried the kids out and hugged them. He went into the house and saw what had happened. He saw the guy and instantly began screaming. Turns out that guy was the kid's mother's ex-boyfriend, arrested for sexually assaulting and abusing the kids and mother. He'd come back to seemingly kill them, probably Turner too and hurt them one last time. The kids got later taken into care, and the boy... The boy died a few years later in a car accident, while Turner took him away. Was allowed contact every two weeks, supervised. He drove high and killed the boy, severely injured the carer and himself. That was what it took for me to finally get clean. I wish it hadn't. But then, maybe if it was clean, I wouldn't have been there for those kids. I don't know. I carry an insane amount of guilt, always. I attempted suicide six months later, but then I decided that I was selfish. I had to use my experience to help others. So I went to school. I volunteered and now work in a mental health unit, specializing in those with substance abuse issues. It'll never fix it bring the boy or Tess back, but maybe it'll save someone else. I guess I just wanted to tell the story. I never have before, not to anyone other than the police and social services. As awful as it was, what adds to my guilt is that for that reason, because that happened, I was finally saved. Social workers realized I was unaccounted for, uncared for, and neglected. They took me into rehab straight away, and helped me get clean. I got fostered by an amazing woman who unfortunately died last year. That horrific, violent incident saved my life. I just wish it had theirs, too. I can't say his name, but rest in peace, boy. Tess, Dad, and Julie. You're the reason I'm a better person now, so thank you. Thank you for reading, and I hope it didn't darken your day too much.
Hi there. Long time lurker and got plenty of stories to share. This one makes my skin crawl, and my whole insides cringe just thinking about it. Here's some of the backstory. I grew up in a small town in New Zealand, and had recently moved to a big city for university. The town I grew up in was a really rough and gang-oriented place, so I was always somewhat weary of strangers. However, I didn't really give much thought to little old white men in mobility scooters. Living in a big city was awesome, because I got to go shopping in malls and Kmart. Kmart in New Zealand is probably the equivalent of Walmart in the US, but us Kiwis seem to love it a lot. Anyway, one day I was shopping at Kmart, looking at the dog beds which were at the back aisle of the store. Kmart is huge and the back aisle is the entire length of the store. I get this feeling suddenly that I'm being watched, and turn to see an old man in a mobility scooter at the opposite end, staring directly at me. I give him a small smile, and turn back to browsing, when in my peripheral vision I see him racing towards me in his scooter at great speed. I immediately assumed that his urgency must mean he needs help reaching for something, or finding something else, so I turned to face him. He was a harmless old man, right? Wrong. He quickly starts chatting to me and sharing personal things with me without actually greeting me. He starts telling me how I look like his wife who passed when she was younger. He then starts telling me how lonely he is, and I start to feel a bit of pity for him. Then the conversation starts taking a weird turn. He starts telling me how he likes to dress up and feel sexy in women's clothing. Then he starts to open his mouth and show me all of his missing teeth and gums. The sudden turn of conversation startles me. This sudden turn of conversation startles me, and I start to realize that I need to end this and leave him immediately. After several attempts at saying goodbye, he finally agrees to let me go and holds out his hand for a goodbye handshake. Desperate to leave, I agree to shake his hand in order for him to leave me alone. Suddenly his grip tightens, and I can't pull my hand away. He forces my hand towards his mouth, and begins to make out with the back of my hand while swishing his tongue across it in circles. I aggressively pull my hand away, and sprint out of the store in shock. The air from running makes the back of my hand feel cold and slimy. So I run to the mall toilets and scrub my hand for a solid ten minutes, vowing to never let him talk to me again. I thought I'd never see him again. Until just recently, I did. I was on the bus to uni when he gets on without his mobility scooter and a walking stick instead. Thankfully, I had someone already sitting next to me, so I felt pretty safe. However, his eyes scanned the bus, and when they met mine, he immediately smiled. So when the bus got to the interchange, where everyone gets off and gets onto other buses, I quickly rushed off the bus so I wouldn't have to see him. I felt my stomach hit the floor when I hear him start calling out for me. I glance over my shoulder to see him waving his walking stick, yelling and pursuing after me. I quickly rush out into a shopping store to lose him which is a success. The rest of the day goes fine, until I go to return home and see that he's waiting at the stop I board my bus at. I hide until I can see my bus coming. He's looking around a bit, and starts to wander away from the bus stop after a while, which is my cue to quickly board. I jump in line and get on board quickly. However, he spotted me and is waving his stick and yelling at me again. I start to panic, as I don't want to be trapped in the bus with him. He's just about to step on the bus, when the driver all of a sudden slams the doors on him. And this makes him furious, and he starts smashing his walking stick against the window and shouting. And I look at the driver, who smiles at me, gives me a nod, and starts to pull away onto the road. I'm overjoyed that this kind driver literally saved me from this creepy old man. So I step up to the window he's hitting 
and stare directly at him with the filthiest look I can give while the bus slowly drives away. I literally felt like I got my power back. I later found out that this old man is a well-known creep in the community, which makes me grateful that the bus driver saved me that day. So lesson for everyone. Don't let your kindness keep you trapped in a situation that's dangerous. If someone is giving you the creeps, it's for a good reason. I'm a 27-year-old female. At the time this occurred, I was a senior in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. For this story, I'm going to hide her identity solely due to the rules on Reddit. Let's call her Kay. Kay almost cost me my life, and I never want to see her again. Now, a little backstory on her. She had grown up quite privileged, given anything she ever wanted. Her parents adopted her five cousins, and this is when she started to rebel. Her parents, well off, started to pay less attention to her, so Kay had all the freedom in the world. At the time this incident occurred, Kay was 18, and I had just turned 18 as well. We were headed to a kickback at these guys' house, and nothing more than a little bit of weed was expected. Now, I had my share of smoking weed, popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning on staying sober. Shia picked me up, and we wanted to buy cigs at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink, one with the straw and everything. This is crucial for later in the story. We arrive at the apartment, and everyone is smoking, including Kay, but I declined. She would always say shit about how she never wanted to be high alone, complained about how I never got as high as she did. So I obliged, and I cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit. She asked for a drink of my soda, and I handed it to her. She had it for a good minute. I had my head turned, talking to someone at the kickback. When I looked back at Kay, she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it, and she handed it back to me right away. Within about 30 minutes or so, though, I started to feel intensely high, to the point that I needed to escape from the group. I'd go out front to smoke a cigarette, only to find that I couldn't even stand up, so I laid on the front porch. Then, all of these dark thoughts flashed through my mind. I felt so sick, like my stomach was being torn open. I couldn't stand back up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up. I thought to myself, all of this just from clearing a bog? So I laid back on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city I live in. I thought about running into traffic just because I felt so much like I was dying. So I gave myself two options. I could run into traffic, have a car hit me and end this horrible pain I was in, or I could get some help, maybe flag someone down. Obviously, my mind wasn't in the right state. I knew nobody at the kickback would take me seriously, and I knew something was terribly wrong. I thought about calling my mom. I must have dialed her number and hung up about five different times. Finally, I called and told her what had happened, and that I didn't know why I was so high. Nobody else was feeling the way I felt. What seemed like an eternity later, Kay finally came outside looking for me. As I'm puking my guts out in the bushes, she asked me if I want to go get some food. I asked her if she was being fucking serious. She laughed at me as I puked. What I didn't know was that my mother had called my older brother to pick me up since he lived close to where I was. He showed up with a machete, ran inside and threatened people. He didn't know who gave me what. It wasn't until I got home that my brother took one look at my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were, so they rushed me to the ER after more puking, of course. My memory there is a bit fuzzy. I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. They ended up having to sedate me, due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses, totally out of character for me. 
They did a tox screen and found MDMA, along with other drugs in my system. I'm assuming the other drugs were the ones used to make up the ecstasy. Now, all of this is frightening to me and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay had been to a house party the next night. Somebody there had said she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had grand mal seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming whatever ecstasy she had used was a bad batch. Remember when she asked to have a drink of my soda? I assume this is when she dropped a pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something. I have no clue. But at this time in my life, I hadn't done drugs for quite a while, especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I was the one who slipped her the drug, and she had to go to the hospital. She's a pathological liar, and has had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders. All of this happened just because she wanted me to be high like her. I could have committed suicide because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It still affects me to this day. It sounds cliche, but I have a hard time trusting people with this experience and among other things. I also don't like sharing drinks with anybody. I get scared when I go to a bar or club, fearing for the worst. I mean, if my own friend could do this to me, what's stopping a stranger? So I always guard my drink now, no matter what. This happened a long time ago when I was younger, and I have a really bad memory. This is just me recounting the memory to the best of my ability, and what I was told. I also want to preface the story by saying that this story takes place somewhere in Indonesia, where it's somewhat more commonplace to have maids in your household. When I was younger, I had a strong relationship with my extended family, to me, it was normal to be close with your extended family. And when I mean extended, I don't even know how they're related to me, to be honest. In particular, I was close with my granddad's family, calling her Granddad Sheila, whose daughters slash in-laws were like my big sisters. And being the eldest child, I liked being babied by them since I was always expected to be the big sister from my little brother. This is important for later. I was maybe 11 years old or younger. Neither my parents or I could remember when exactly it happened. I just want to say, as a kid, I loved milk. I still do, though I tend to stick with skim milk for now. When I was younger, I had a favorite local brand that had the usual strawberry flavor. The brand was called Ultra Milk. It was always cool that I was drinking something pink. Unbeknownst to my parents, a gift basket had showed up to our doorstep, and the maids had taken the gift, thinking it was a present from one of my mother's friends. My parents had even seen the gift basket, and didn't think much of it later. It was full of fruit, sweets, and the usual kinds of things you would send to someone maybe on a special occasion. It should have been weird that there wasn't a special occasion, but another weird part was that usually gift baskets had a card, or something to indicate where it had come from, but there was no indication from who it had come from this time. The maids had overlooked it, and my parents didn't notice at the time. They had assumed the head maid had checked it thoroughly, which she didn't. In the gift basket, there was my favorite tiny carton of my favorite milk, even strawberry flavored. I had lessons with a tutor, and oftentimes the maid accompanying me to the lesson would bring me snacks or food, since the tutoring could take a few hours. I was at my tutor's house, and she was teaching me about the homework I got today, when I got thirsty and got my carton of milk to take a sip out of it. I was ready to take a sip of the extremely sweet, artificially flavored strawberry milky goodness. But something was wrong. It didn't taste right. I don't remember what it did taste like, but I could tell immediately that something was very wrong. I remember describing to my parents that it felt like I had licked the bottom of a metal-framed chair 
that I had in my room and my desk. It just tasted awful. Thinking that maybe it was spoiled, my mom had warned me about drinking spoiled milk and how it can really upset your stomach. I immediately, without swallowing, grabbed some tissues at the table and spat out the mouthful into the tissue. I was surprised to see some sort of weird metallic beads in it. Like metal, but it was liquid. I've never seen anything like it, and I was so confused. My tutor was even more confused and horrified that I had just spat out a strange metallic substance. I didn't really understand what was going on, but my tutor immediately asked to take the carton of milk where I had tried to drink from and told me to continue working while she went to investigate. Apparently, my tutor and her head maid went outside and poured a bit more of the milk into a tissue. There were more of this weird liquid metal bits in there. She asked me if I had drank any of it, and I told her that maybe I had taken a sip and swallowed before I realized something bad was in there. After that, my tutor called my mom and told her that I had possibly been poisoned. I went home without finishing my lesson, slightly concerned that maybe something was wrong. I went home and I don't really remember what happened after that. There isn't a poison control center in my country, and no emergency services that would really respond. Third world country and all that. So my parents took me to a doctor to have blood tests. I remember being pulled out of school. My mom wanted me to stay home from school for the next few days, which was great for me. No one told me the severity of the situation, and my mom just told me that she wanted me to chill at home for a while. No school? I get to have fun? No way. So that's what I did. I stayed home and watched Avatar The Last Airbender on DVD, while my parents were fretting over the idea that I might have been poisoned by mercury. The gift basket, which had already been taken apart and stored to eat for later, was reassembled, and my parents tried to go with it to the police. They couldn't really do anything since we literally had no leads on where this gift came from, since it had no cards and the police really couldn't care less about our situation. I don't really know what happened other than that I was pretty cool with staying home and playing. My life at home wasn't perfect. I had some issues with my parents. But they were really nice to me during this time, so I enjoyed it a lot since I didn't really understand. I think my parents kept a lot of things from me, to keep me from getting scared. My parents even took me overseas to Singapore, even taking the liquid found in the carton with them in a tin or whatever, to show the doctors there. I got tested some more and didn't seem to have any signs of the poisoning. I guess I didn't swallow enough of it. I'm not sure if it really was mercury. No one has ever told me. But at the end of the day, everyone was glad that I didn't drink enough of it to get affected by whatever it was. Now to get into the suspect part. My parents later told me that they had a sneaking suspicion that it was possible that Grand Aunt Sheila was the one who tried to poison me. I didn't know this at the time, but around the time of this incident, she was found to have stolen gold and jewelry from my parents' store for years, worth somewhere in the thousands. My parents were furious and wanted to report her to the authorities, but my grandma, her sister, loved her too much and instead just cut contact with her. Since then... Sheila has seemed to want to enact vengeance over being caught, and has been trying to get back at us. My mom had warned me that I couldn't play with the big sisters, Grand Aunt Sheila's daughters, anymore, since they did something very bad, and to never get in the car with them if they showed up at my school. It hadn't clicked in my mind until now. Thinking back, she was close enough to me to know that I loved drinking milk, and maybe tried to hurt my family, even if it meant hurting her grandniece. We could never confirm if it was her, but Grand Aunt Sheila has continued to be a thorn in my family's side for years now. Though my parents have learned a lesson, and ensured that whenever we received a gift basket, there always had to be a name on it. My grandmother doesn't believe her sister did it, but my parents firmly believe she was responsible. We had no proof, though, other than her horrible character. We received weird gifts, like black seeds, 
and hair that was supposedly used in some sort of witchcraft. We assumed that this was all from Grand Aunt Sheila, who lived in the same city as us. It only made sense. My parents never bought me the Ultra Milk brand again, which I was okay with since that moment spoiled the brand to me. I was reminded of this story while drinking strawberry milk the other day. A different brand. I'm no longer living in Indonesia, not in the same country as Grand Aunt Sheila. Even so... I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I figured she was weirded out that I didn't wake her up sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and went on with my day. I can't win them all, I guess. I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized I hadn't asked for her name. I'm a bit hard of hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name. Lucy, right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say, she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks, I finally got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak and finding out about my personal life. I'm a serial oversharer, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in saying how fucked up things were and that she'd kick my friend's ass for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even at 16, I knew that was pretty cringy, and I was going through my emo phase at the time. The thing that really bugged me at the time was that she'd asked so much about me, but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel shitty, always venting and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days, and I let another girl sit by me, since it was an overcrowded bus and I didn't think it mattered much. When Lucy finally came back and saw me sitting by another girl, you'd think she'd just gotten shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember exactly what Lucy said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her rival was gone... Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me, and all was sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while, things started to get hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities, and any time I got upset about it, she would give me shit for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy wasn't breaking me down, though, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus, and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time she hit me. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory, some kind of cinematic moment in my life. But honestly, it all just blended together after a while. I know it started off small, though flicking me and playful slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me hard in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive, until she slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a shitty joke, and she shoved me as hard as she could into the wall. She laughed because of the sound I made, before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us, but they didn't do anything. Sometimes I wonder what they must have thought of me. I didn't dump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started to get into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. Either she was right, or it was an 
honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every time I did, she would have a new sob story I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get in my head that she was some tragic soul and that I could somehow help her. I convinced myself there was something noble about taking the abuse, and nobody I knew tried to step in and help me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three-week span. First, I found out she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. It felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse. She seemed excited by it like I'd be happy she had invaded my privacy. The second weird thing that happened was when I tried to wake her up on the bus. After about a half hour on my chest not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at our stop, and she just got up, looked me in the eye, and told me that she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it or anything, just... I pretend to sleep on you sometimes. What the hell? The breaking point came when she was showing off some award she got from school. There was something off about the award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had her name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem was that it wasn't addressed to a Lucy. You can't imagine what it felt like when I found out I didn't even know my own girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights, and I broke things off. Lucy always was the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop. It felt like she wanted me to know she was watching me. One day, when she got on the bus, she looked me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to her new seat. I'm pretty sure she was expecting me to say something to her. The next year, I finally graduated and got a retail job. End of the story, right? I thought so too. It was the start of Christmas season, and I was working as a cashier that night. Lucy came into the store I was working at. Random chance. It had been a year and a half since we'd broken up at this point so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend it wasn't weird. She gave me this look like the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nuts. She grabbed something from the front and went right into my line. She didn't say a word to me, but she wouldn't break eye contact, and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt just to look at her. I rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support, and she told me that she was getting weird vibes. I got this really bad gut feeling after Lucy left. Lucy became a regular at our little shop. She would come in and creep out my co-workers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came while ringing her out, and she would say that she was visiting me. She didn't say my name, but she described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think maybe she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite lots of complaints, because the managers were penny-pinching assholes who would sell any one of us out to get sales up. I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard about how often she came. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth minimum wage. The last time I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance so you could see right in from the front of the store proper. I left to put the stuff in my cart, 
and when I came back, I saw her. She was standing about forty feet from the back entrance, as still as a statue. I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours, before she suddenly turned around and walked briskly away. The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I got back, and she was a lot more awkward after that. The girl quit three days later, and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I guess I can never know for sure. I left the store not too long after that, and got a job that didn't involve customer service. That wasn't the last time I saw her, though. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I had a bit of a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable, and that Lucy was the only person I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her. With the stars in the sky, lit by street lamps, I saw her. She was with another girl. I got so close I could almost touch her, before I snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and I realized I was becoming like her. I ran home and I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for some dinner. I thought I saw her in line, but I convinced myself it was someone else. I ordered and sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate and she took the table between me and the window I was looking out. She was with some guy that looked vaguely familiar, maybe a school friend. She was sat in an angle, so she was half looking at him, and every few seconds she would look right at me. I know it was her. She changed her hair, and it looks an awful lot like mine now. After I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror, and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She must have been reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she'll turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when she does show up. Lucy's been a part of my life for the past four years. We dated for four months in high school, and now she keeps turning up. I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, but I feel like she broke me as a person, and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I've developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous leaving my house, and people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. I've tried to date since, but I just can't. It's too much work at this point, so I've decided that I'll stay single until I can work through some of my issues. I was living downtown in a posh building that had a good restaurant next door. The restaurant and the apartment building opened at the same time so it automatically sort of became where everyone in the building went. I worked across the street, so it was where my firm would have client meetings and happy hours. I went in one night alone near closing time, which I had done in the past, and sat at the bar. I had been out that evening to happy hour, but that had been several hours before, and I had been home since then. I ordered a steak dinner and a glass of wine, my favorite. I was familiar with the bartender because of the happy hours and one specific first date where the guy I was meeting, who was from Poland, recognized the bartender's accent as Serbian. They had had some geopolitical banter while we had drinks and the bartender seemed like an okay guy at the time. Mid-twenties, average and pretty nondescript. On this night, I'm pretty sure we had some small talk while he worked but I don't think I actually engaged all that much with him. I don't even know his name. Anyway, halfway through my meal, I started to get ridiculously tired. Like, barely keep your eyes open tired. I asked for a box for my meal. He took a while getting it, 
but when he presented it, he told me he was walking me home. I said no thanks. He insisted. Three more times. At that point, I probably could have used the help walking, but I was so fully annoyed at being told someone was walking me home. Not only was I clear he was not welcome to do that, I actually had a habit of never letting a guy walk me to my door. I don't like randos to know where I live, and I once had an acquaintance try to push in with me after an all-building cocktail party. So yeah, there was no way this was going to happen, no matter what. I remember I got loud with my final no, and took a few more sips of wine. Hey, I paid 20 bucks for that class, and I was not going to waste it, as I stood to leave. He seemed a little taken aback. He snatched up my glass and said he was coming with me, so I remember that I simply left before he could do or say anything else. Well, I made it next door to my apartment, and as I'm going in the elevator, I could barely walk. I felt beyond drunk, even though I had barely finished half a glass of my wine. When I made it to the eighth floor, I could barely stand. I literally crawled from the elevator down my very long hallway, around the corner and almost to my door. When I got within feet from my door, my legs had stopped working completely. I could barely climb up the door to insert the key, but I somehow managed and dragged myself over the threshold. I woke up the next day slumped against my door, and I had wet myself. I had never lost control of my body, no matter how drunk I've gotten, and I definitely have never slept on the floor where I dropped. It was crazy. I had a hangover from hell, and I was trying to figure out all day what had happened. I told myself that since I had been at happy hour earlier, maybe I was just drunk and didn't know it when I went for my late meal. But I didn't remember feeling drunk when I was there, and I hadn't really eaten until the steak and potatoes I had ordered. I kept searching for a reason. It was a couple of days before I remembered how overly familiar the bartender had been in trying to walk me home. It chilled me what could have happened if that guy had done so. I had no proof that he had done anything, but somehow I just knew. I felt stupid I had gone back out that night when I could have just eaten at home. And I felt stupid for not watching him more closely, even though I had been alone at a bar. I felt stupid for going to the bar at all, when I could have eaten at a table. But I just couldn't be sure enough of anything to report it anywhere. I just kind of hid for a couple of months, refusing to walk by the window in front of the bar side of the restaurant, and generally avoiding that corner altogether. It was at least two months before I could go back in that restaurant, and even then it was only for work. I was relieved when I didn't see him at the bar, but I had to ask in case he was coming later or something. When I asked where he was, the person behind the bar said really flatly, Oh him? Yeah, he's gone. We had to let him go. I remember searching the bartender's face for a clue, and picked up on some mild disgust. I said good or something, and he started to talk, but thought better of it, and the conversation ended there. I've worked night audit for a new Bampton in one of the safest areas near me for a little over two years now. It's got direct access to two main highways. I've had a fair share of creepy guests and weirdos, but most were easy check-ins or fixes, and they're on their way. However, last night changed everything up. As safe as my property is, we do have shady $40 a night motels on either side of our building. There's been some shit that went down at both places, and occasionally their guests try to sneak into my hotel for a free breakfast. I have, on two occasions, seen the police raid both hotels and spend all night searching for people who ran, collecting evidence as well, I presume. It's been a while since I've had such entertainment, though. So anyway, it's about 2.30 a.m., and I'm getting ready to run my night audit. My doors are locked, and this guy who's dirty but in a construction worker kind of way walks up. 
We had plenty of construction workers stay here, as we aren't far from their site and we're rated number one in the area. So I open the door for him and ask if he needs a room before I run the audit. He grins at me, but it's anything but a warm welcome. It looks fake and almost threatening. He looks at me for a second and says, I have a guest in room 144. His wording caught me off guard. Not many say they have a guest in a room. Usually it's, I'm here for, or I'm meeting. The second issue is that we don't have a room 144, and neither do any of the same brand names in my area. I've been to all the immediate ones. So I inform him that we don't have a room 144. He looks at me for a second and says, Ah shucks, I guess I got stood up. He giggles and walks out the door. I thought this was very odd, but whatever. I go back to running the audit. As I'm finishing up, the phone rings. A guy starts chuckling and says there's a car in your parking lot with its lights on. Oh, and by the way, I'm the guy that just got stood up. Now one, it's been 30 minutes since he walked out my door. Why is he still hanging around in my parking lot? Two, Nobody has come or gone since him, and there are no lights on in the parking lot before he came. And three, why do I need to know that you're the guy who got stood up? I brush it off as a bit odd, but my gut is telling me something weird is going on here. I wait about five minutes, and then walk around to the front of the building from the inside, and see no cars in my parking lot with lights on. It's not very well lit, so it will be pretty easy to spot. I'm back at the front desk, waiting for Audit to finish up its thing so I can get ready to start breakfast, when the phone rings again. I pick it up and it's the creepy guy again, telling me there's lights on in the parking lot. It must have been at least another 20 minutes since the last call, so again why would he still be in my parking lot? I feel I may have missed something between the windows, so I go to my locker door peek my head out real quick to do a swift scan of the lot, and my eye catches someone standing in the corner of the parking lot. It's the creepy guy, and he's standing there watching me. There's also no car with its lights on. I run back inside, double check that all the doors are locked, and I start to feel a sense of panic, that something really bad is about to happen, flow over me. I've never felt this feeling before while on my shift and only once before in my entire life. Let's just say I have physical scars still from what happened that time. I get back to the front desk, and I immediately call the local PD. I explain the situation to dispatch, and they ask if it's ever happened before. I tell them no, but I also inform them that I'm the only employee on the property, and I would like for them to scan the parking lot and check in with me if possible. The PD pulls up and wants to get a description from me before searching the area. Well, as he's getting out of the car, he notices movement. The creepy guy takes off. The cop walks in a little nervous and tells me what he just saw while using his radio to call for backup. Three more show up, and they discuss it, searching my parking lot and the two neighboring lots. They seem to come up with nothing but stick around to patrol the parking lot until the sun comes up. The PD stopped by once since my shift started tonight to check on me and said they would be in the area if I needed anything. While here, they tell me that a total of three men fled the parking lot from different directions that night. He believes that the creepy man was trying to lure me into the parking lot away from the doors so I would end up trapped between the three of them. He didn't go much further as to what could have happened from there, and honestly, I don't want to dwell on it. The worst thing that ever happened to me happened at a hotel. I was making a cross-country drive. I won't say where it was exactly, because I really don't think that was important. However, it was a long and lonely cross-country highway. I had been driving a long time and very late into the night. 
There weren't many cars, and the ones that were there wouldn't turn off their high beams, so it was a lonely and tired experience. Each streetlight hit my eyes like a hypnotist's watch, making me feel as if I was in some sort of long and painful to my eyes dream. I'm one of those people who likes driving at night, because I tend to make better time, but I was having way too difficult of a problem this night. Eventually, I decided to just give in and go to a motel. It was a bit of a run-down place. I didn't even like the look of it at first, but who knows how much longer I would have had to drive before I found another. The office, once I walked up, was more like a movie theater ticket booth than a motel office. There was a glass booth, and I had to pass my credit card and ID underneath the glass. It was just weird. The man at the counter was a bit creepy, too. He kept looking at me in this strange way, and I could have sworn I saw him checking me out over and over. I felt dirty once I finally got my key, and went into my room. However dirty I felt, though, I definitely didn't want to take a shower right away in that room. It wasn't dirty, don't get me wrong, but it did sort of smell really weird. I checked the bed sheets, and they were very clean, which made me happy but I could tell the carpet was very old. While it may have been vacuumed, I figured that was probably where the smell was coming from. The bathroom was clean, but I noticed that the water smelled too, and that's why I decided to skip the shower. I got changed up and got ready for bed. I thought I'd check out an hour or so of television and try to fall asleep after that. Yeah, I had been falling asleep on the road, but I always like to see something on TV before going to bed. I had almost fallen asleep while watching. While I was dozing, I suddenly heard a knock at the door. I made my way over, stumbling as I was extremely tired. When I looked through the keyhole, I saw a rather large and nasty looking man. He had to be six foot five, and I couldn't even hazard a guess to his weight. He was also really dirty, and I can't even describe how gross he looked. I wasn't about to open that door. I did ask through the door, though, if I could help him somehow. Hey, yeah, the manager told me I needed to come and get you and take you to the desk, he told me. There was a problem with your card. It was very fishy. This was a motel. The manager could have just called me. In fact, I asked the man this. Oh, the main phone at the desk is broken, he informed me. You have to come out to the desk. There was a problem with your card. I wasn't going outside. I told the man to wait for a minute, went over to my computer which I had connected to the motel internet. I pulled up the website for my card. When I did, it confirmed that the money had gone through just fine on my motel stay. I was about to check something else when the man began fiercely pounding on the door. Sir, if you don't come out right now, we're going to have to call the police, the man yelled at me. You'll be arrested for trespassing since you didn't pay for the room. Well, if this guy was planning on attacking me or killing me or something, he'd really made a mistake getting so aggressive. I wasn't about to come out now, and his reasoning was extremely stupid. I went over to the door and made sure the bolt was locked tight. I yelled at the man to get away, because now I was calling the cops. His response was shocking. You call the police, he yelled back, surprised and incredulous. You call the police? Sure, call the damn police. All they're gonna do is arrest your ass. You're trespassing, you idiot. You'll go to jail immediately. Only way you ain't is if you come out of this door right now. I went ahead and phoned the police while the man was still pounding on the door. Apparently, they were already on their way, as the motel attendant and one of my neighbors had heard the ruckus and called them immediately. Going back to the door, I told the man that I had called the cops and we'd just see who would get arrested. Well, he didn't waste any time. He ran off, jumped into a pickup truck, and sped off into the night. When the police arrived, we gave him the full story. They arrested the man while we were talking, actually. Apparently, he was an ex-con. He had served time for aggravated assault and attempted murder. I found out much later, during the case, that he had also been wanted and charged with murdering a motel guest in a neighboring state. He pretended to be a motel worker, demanded a woman come out of her room because her car didn't go through. Well, she went with him, and he beat her badly. She died. After he was found guilty in our court, he was taken to the other state and prosecuted there, where he afterwards got a life sentence.
I was going into the city for work. My company was sending me in for some training, and I was actually excited. They were sending me to one of those high-rise hotels, and I had never been to one of them before. It was an all-expenses-paid vacation to me, in a way. I had money for food and a little for entertainment as well. I was also so excited that my hotel room was on a really high floor. I just always wanted to be on a high floor of a building. When I got into the hotel, I was pretty impressed with the money my company must have spent to get me there. I checked in, went to the elevator, and came all the way to the 50th floor. I got into my room and immediately went to the window. I looked out onto the city. It was Las Vegas, by the way. Anyhow, I decided to go out and spend my first night hitting the casinos. I went out of my room and got on the elevator. When I did, I noticed there was only one other person inside. I guess I should feel somewhat bad about labeling him immediately, but he seemed extremely filthy and I almost thought he was homeless, honestly. He didn't appear to be the type of person who could stay at such a nice hotel anyway. Several times, the man tried to start up a conversation with me. I politely gave him yes or no answers to most of them. He asked me if I was going any place in particular, and I just told him I was going to be at the casinos. When he asked if I needed someone to show me around, I gave him an absolute no. The guy stopped talking after this, but even though we were the only two people in the elevator, he began slowly moving closer and closer towards me. I tried to ignore him. You know, pretend he wasn't there, but it didn't stop him from moving. Soon, he was so close to me that I could practically hear his breaths. I was dying, hoping the long elevator ride would end, but I still had a while to go. Thankfully, just when I thought I was going to yell at the man or something, the elevator stopped at a floor. The guy quickly moved away from me, verifying that he must be a creep. Thankfully, the couple that got on stayed on the elevator all the way to the bottom floor, since no one else got on after them. When we got to the lobby, he followed me out the door and turned to walk the same way I did. I began walking a bit faster, trying to get a head start on him. I was able to lose him in the crowded streets of Las Vegas. I felt a sudden wave of relief when I did. More than once while I was out enjoying myself, though, I saw the man in the same casino I was in. Each time, I wasn't quite sure if he had seen me or not, so I would just try to lay low and even go to a different casino. I just wanted nothing to do with him. When I had had enough of all this casino browsing, I decided to go back to my room and get some sleep. I kept a watchful eye out around me and was happy that I hadn't seen the man even once on my way back. I felt extremely happy. That is, until I got back to the hotel. He was in the lobby. He was in the lobby seated on a couch right beside the elevator. He looked up as I approached the elevator, and I could see his eyes light up. I went to push the button on the back, just checking to see how he would react. Instantly, he stood up. It was obvious he was waiting to get back on the elevator with me. I figured he must have been following me around, and then realized that it made more sense to wait in a place he knew I would go to, the hotel lobby. Well, there was no way I was going to get on the elevator again with this creep. I went immediately away from the elevator, over to the lobby, and complained to the desk clerk. I asked for an escort to my room. They not only got a security guard to escort me, the guard had a talk with the creep as well. He told him he was making me feel uncomfortable, and it would be better if he left me alone. He made the man wait while he went into the elevator with me. I was there for a few days after that, and I did see the man around again. But thankfully, he never rode the elevator with me, and never tried to talk to me or anything after that. I don't tend to make too many long drives. One of the reasons is that I don't really like staying in motels. I don't care how clean a motel is. In my mind, it's nearly impossible for it to ever be so. No matter what, people I don't know have slept in the beds and in the sheets that I would be sleeping on. Tons of people would have used the same toilets and showers that I would be using, and I'm just not the sort of person that can deal with that sort of thing, so I tried to avoid it altogether. I was driving home from college to visit my parents. Normally the drive is 14 hours straight through, 
I basically have to get right out of bed, and I only have an hour or so to visit my parents on arrival, before heading straight to sleep. On the particular trip that this story happens on, I ran into a few things that just happened to halt my progress. First off, I got a little bit of a late start, because we ended up having a power outage in the dorm. My alarm clock, therefore, didn't go off. I figured I could still probably make it, but I had never driven at that time. I had to go through a major city, and I hit them right at the peak of their traffic. My car was slowed down to a complete stop at times. I had never experienced traffic that was so horrible before in my life. Before I knew it, I had lost an extra three hours, bringing the grand total of hours that I was behind to five. I tried my best to make it up by driving fast and taking less bathroom breaks overall, but the time I was able to make up was quite minimal. I called my parents and let them know that I was going to be showing up about five hours late. However, when my eyes began to shut on their own, I realized it would be too dangerous to keep driving. Coffee was just doing nothing for me. I called my parents once again and let them know I wouldn't get there until the following day. I was going to have to check into a motel. I tried looking for one of those chain motels. I don't know why, I just figured they'd be cleaner for some reason. However, I wasn't able to find one before it just got too dangerous for me to drive any further, so I picked the next random motel I could find. I didn't get a good impression from this motel right away. I walked into the office and there was no one there. I rang the bell and heard some noise coming from a room behind the desk. A man, maybe in his 40s, came out from that back room. I could tell he had been sleeping in the office. He kept looking at me in a way that made me very uncomfortable as well. He kept his face down towards the desk, but his eyes were always looking straight up at me. He did this nearly the entire time that I was checking in. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I got my key finally and was able to get to my room. For a motel that wasn't a chain, it was actually quite large. I had to drive around to my room and parked right in front of it. I felt a bit better about the experience once I got to it. It was about as clean as you could expect a motel room to be. Still, I couldn't bring myself to shower there. I hadn't brought my shower shoes that I use in the dorm. After I had gotten ready for bed, I turned out the light and went to sleep. I was surprised at how easily I went out. I woke up a bit later, and I was unsure what had woken me up. I'm not one of those people who wakes up during the night often either. I tend to sleep straight through, actually. I assumed I'd heard some sort of noise and waited to see if I could hear it once again. When I didn't after a while, I decided to just lay back down. I slept for what seemed like a long time, but once I woke up once more, I noticed it had only been about half an hour. Again, I wasn't quite sure what had woken me up. I assumed it must have been a noise, but there was nothing when I tried to listen to one. Once again, I laid back down and tried to go to sleep. However, this time it wasn't so easy. I had been woken up twice already, and I was feeling a bit unnerved at this point. I laid down and had my eyes closed for a while, and then I felt something. It wasn't much at first. It just felt like a slight movement on the bed. I figured it was nothing, until I slowly began feeling something pressing down on the bottom left corner. It felt as if someone were putting a distinct pressure right there. I opened my eyes once again and shot up, this time turning on the lamp. The man, the one who had checked me into the motel, was in the room with me. He didn't have a weapon or anything, but he was there at the corner of the bed. He had been trying to get into or onto the bed with me. It was then when I realized that he must have been what had woken me up the previous two times, and it must have been because he was trying to get onto the bed quietly. I was horrified further by realizing the man must have been in the room with me the entire time I had been sleeping. I'm not really that big of a guy, but I'm in decent shape, and I was extremely angry. I jumped out of the bed and grabbed the lamp off the table, threatening to beat the man's ass. He seemed unsure of what to do, and finally decided on bolting out of the room. I quickly used the phone to call the cops. The man had just gone back to the desk. Apparently, he also called the cops at the same time, saying he had an unruly guest he needed thrown out. Turned out the man had a previous record of doing similar things, however, so the police instantly believed me and arrested him. Eventually, I was allowed to just go on my way. 
I went straight home and never slept in a motel ever again. I wonder how many people listening to these stories remember video stores. I know there are still a few here and there, but I have no idea how they'll continue to survive. What I do know is that most of them are now gone, and that when I used to work at one, I found them to be a particularly creepy place to be at night. For some stupid reason, before Blockbuster closed, they thought it would be a good idea to stay open until 2 a.m. in the summer, because apparently people just get these cravings to rent movies in the middle of the night or something, and we had to be there to fulfill that need. Yeah, it made no sense. What it did make for was extremely grouchy employees, sitting around in empty stores, jumping at every little noise because you could never tell if there was someone hiding behind those tall shelves. And that's exactly when this story takes place. The sweltering summer heat and the industrial air conditioning combined at the large windows in front to cause them to be completely fogged up. The store was silent, as I'd muted that annoying trailer that we kept on loop at all hours of the day, having heard it one too many times already. My manager was in the back doing manager things, which I assume meant jerking off or something, and I was standing up at the counter bored as ever, having completed every closing duty possible about an hour before close. I couldn't even remember when the last customer had even come in. In fact, now that I thought about it a little, I couldn't remember when the last customer even left. Suddenly, I wasn't sure that I was alone in here after all. I decided to do a sweep of the store just in case, so I left the front and walked along the new release wall looking into each aisle as I passed by. The shelves in the middle of the store were six feet tall, so I couldn't see most people without doing this. I passed drama and action without seeing a soul, but when I reached comedy, I heard a noise further up the aisle. Nothing sinister, just the light thunk of DVD cases bumping into one another. Either the manager had come out of the back without me knowing, or we still had a customer in the store. Yay. The noise was coming from further down, closer to the anime and horror section. I decided to go say hi and see if this person needed any help. As I got closer, I noticed the sound again. I assumed they were just picking up the boxes to read and putting them back in the wrong place, causing them to bang into the other boxes. Great. More stuff for me to clean up, I guess. The first thing I saw as I reached the aisle was empty DVD boxes lying all over the floor. What the hell? I hadn't heard a crash or anything. When I rounded the corner, I saw a person sitting in the middle of the aisle with all of the cover boxes lying around him. I stood there and watched him pick them up one by one, study them, and put them back down on the floor. What was he doing? I was very pissed that I was going to have to clean this gigantic mess up. Excuse me, sir. Can I help you? I was a bit snippy because I was annoyed, and I instantly regretted it. He turned to look at me, but it was the strangest movement ever. He moved in a slow, jerky motion, like he was a robot. When his eyes met mine, well, they didn't. His eyes were completely vacant. He smiled this blank smile and just said, You don't have it. I was chilled far beyond the air conditioner. I backed up a single step. We don't have what, sir? You don't have it, he said again, this time tilting his head at me. Apparently, I was supposed to know what he was talking about. Uh, I'm sorry, if you tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can help you. I was thinking, fuck that, I don't want to help this guy, get him out of my store. He turned away from me and hung his head, still sitting on the floor. No, no, it's no good, you don't have it. You don't have it. He began to stand up, and I took a step back. Yeah, well, sorry, I said as he jerkily got to his feet. I had no idea what was going on with this guy. We can't carry everything. Now he was standing there, looking at the mess he had created on the floor. Either way, he was looking down and not at me. I was silently grateful about that. I didn't like the way those eyes felt. We, uh, close soon. I lied. 
We still had at least an hour left. It must have been the wrong thing to say. His head snapped up immediately, and he stared at me. Instead of vacant eyes, they were now piercing. I backed up again. You don't have it, he said again. You don't have it. He began walking towards me. I backed right into the new release wall without even knowing I was moving. I felt the shelves hit me in the back, and DVDs tumbled down around me. I turned and bolted to the back door where the manager would be. The big, lovely metal door that locked automatically. You don't have it, he bellowed, over and over again. I heard the crunch of DVDs under his feet as he chased me down. I reached the back door and pounded frantically on it, screaming to be let in. The manager opened the door, and I nearly bowled him over in my haste to get behind it. He must have seen what I was running from, because he slammed the door quickly, then helped me from the floor where I fell once my shoes had left the carpet and hit the slick floor of the back room. What the... I don't know, I interrupted. Call the police. There was pounding on the door as the man reached it, punctuated by continuing cries. Then, suddenly, there was nothing. We stood there staring at one another. The manager finally grabbed the phone and called the police. I sat in the chair at the desk, and my eyes fell on the monitors for the security system. Obviously, whatever the manager had been doing back here didn't involve watching them. I scanned them, but I couldn't see any sign of the man. Just the huge mess that was left behind of the scattered boxes and the DVDs I'd knocked off the release wall. Had he just left so quickly? The police came and took our statements. The manager gave them the security footage, which did show everything that had happened, which made me feel a little bit more sane. But no arrest was ever made to the best of my knowledge. I never knew what he was, what exactly he even wanted, or what was wrong with him. I never knew what it was we didn't have. It began with a phone call. There were still 20 minutes to closing time, and I was all alone. One of the benefits of being a manager in a fast food burger chain when budget cuts force you to break the always two employees in the building rule. I hadn't seen a customer in over an hour, and I was counting the minutes until I could finally lock those doors. I had already finished most of the closing duties that could be done while we were open, and I was sure I could be out ten minutes after close if we didn't get anyone else. My heart dropped once I heard the phone ring. I knew it was going to be a customer asking when we closed so they could sneak in at five till and give me the most complicated order they could think of to ensure I didn't make it home until a good hour after I'd planned. I took a deep breath and slipped back into customer service mode. Picking up the receiver, I rattled off the expected greeting and waited for the inevitable question. There was a honking noise. It sounded like one of those rubber horns they used to put on bikes. Uh, hello? The honking continued. I realized I was being pranked. I rolled my eyes and hung up the phone. At least it wasn't a customer intent on ruining my night. I checked my watch. Fifteen minutes to go. I walked into the back to check that everything that could be turned off had been, when my eyes caught a movement at the drive through window. I turned to look, and to my surprise, there at the window was a clown. A clown was standing outside the drive through window, just staring at me. I shook off my surprise. I can't serve you through the drive through without a car. Uh, please come to the front. He continued to stare and didn't respond. His bright red nose was practically touching the glass. The front, please, I repeated. We have to close soon, though. With a honk, he stepped away from the window, and I assumed he was going to the front door. Well, this is fucking weird, I thought. I finished what I was doing and went back to the front, but the dining room was empty. No clowns in sight. Maybe they were just screwing around, or maybe they'd changed their mind. I had eight minutes to close, and I wasn't going to worry about some stupid prankster. I stepped into the back again and shut off the music we piped into the dining room. I hated this CD. The same shit over and over again. In the silence, however, I heard another noise. It sounded like some sort of music, 
but it was really quiet. I stepped into the front again to search for the sound and recognized the tinkling tunes of a music box. What the fuck was going on? I still didn't see anyone in the dining room. I walked toward the far end of the counter and realized the music was coming from the hall that led to the restrooms. The door to that hall was in the kitchen, so I went back there, but when I looked toward the door, I saw framed in the porthole window the staring face of the clown from the drive-thru. I found myself suddenly grateful that that door was locked from the kitchen side. The music box continued to play, and the clown continued to stare through the window. His face was completely slack. No smile, no frown, just this blank stare. His makeup, though not smeared, looked somehow faded, and there was more skin tone than white, though he still had a bright red mouth and exaggerated blue eyeshadow, and of course that big red rubber nose. What the hell was going on? Just who was this guy? Was he fucking me, or was he some sort of psycho? Somehow, I managed to find my voice. Sorry, we're closed. You'll have to leave now. I didn't care that we likely had ten minutes left. Policy be damned. I wanted this guy out of my store. He showed no sign that he had heard me. He continued to stare through that window. I knew I wasn't truly safe. Even though the door was locked, there was nothing keeping this clown from climbing over the front counter and coming right into the kitchen. The back office was the safest place for me to go, and I was pretty certain I could get there before he made it to the front counter, much less over it, but I didn't want to have to find out. Sir, please exit the building. We're closed. Come back tomorrow. I expected nothing, but to my surprise he moved. He lifted a small rubber horn to the window and squeezed it slowly then turned and left. I bolted to the back room, my rubber-soled shoes squeaking on the slick floor. As soon as I reached the office, I slammed the door shut. It was a large, heavy metal door designed to protect from robberies. Even though it locked automatically, I double-checked it to be sure and ran to the desk. I grabbed the phone and quickly dialed 911. They probably thought I was full of crazy or some shit. A clown was in the restaurant, and their squeaks were scary. It sounded ridiculous, but that didn't really matter. They were coming all the same. While I waited, I listened to the silence around me. Was he still out there? Had he already left? Was he stealing from the till? Not that I cared if he did. I was just happy I didn't hear pounding or scratching at the door. Nothing to indicate this creepy bastard was trying to get me. Maybe that was his game. Maybe he was just patiently waiting for me to come back out. I imagined him standing just feet away on the other side of the door, waiting for me to open it to see if he was still there. I listened hard for the sound of the honking horn, or the music box, but I heard nothing. Finally, the police arrived, and it was their knock I answered. I admit, I still thought I'd see the clown when I opened the door, but there stood an officer of the law, and I'd never been so happy to see a cop. By the time I finally got out that night, it was well after closing. The cops didn't find the clown, but what they did find was the music box sitting in the middle of the counter. When you opened it, there was a little dancing ballerina clown, and it played that tinkling music I would never forget. It's been two weeks, and I've not seen the clown again, nor heard of any sightings. But I'll tell you, budget cuts be damned, I'm never going to be alone in that place at night again. This actually happened some time ago. I can't even remember if it was possible to lock a phone back then. I had an LG chocolate before the time of smartphones, and I used that phone for everything. Specifically, I used that phone to take some very personal photos that I sent to my long-distance boyfriend. I don't know what it is about using cameras to take pictures of naughty things, but it's been going on ever since cameras were first invented. It's really kind of interesting, if you look into it, but I digress. The point is that I'd taken some very personal photos for my boyfriend, and I never deleted them, or apparently locked my phone. The day came when my boyfriend was coming to visit, and I had to drive to the airport after work to pick him up. 
I worked at a big name cell phone retail store, so lucky for me, I had two phones. The personal one I told you about, and my work phone. When I got out of work the night I was to pick up my boyfriend, I went to the Target by my work to grab a few things before I handed out. What I didn't know was when I got into my car, I somehow dropped my phone in the Target parking lot. I only realized when I was already halfway to the airport. I pulled over to text my boyfriend, only to realize I didn't have my phone. Luckily, I had my work phone, which I used to call my chocolate. I was hoping someone would pick it up, so I could ask them to return it to my work as it was right next door. Three times I called and it rang, until it went to voicemail. On the fourth ring, however, I got an answer. Hello? It was a male voice. I was thrilled to hear it. I told him my name and was just telling him about where I worked when the call cut off suddenly. Frustrated, I called back but it went straight to voicemail. It seemed the battery had died. I would have to hope that the man who found the phone would charge it and call back. Until then, there was nothing I could do, so I used my work phone to contact my boyfriend and was off to the airport to pick him up. He was in town for a week, and during that entire time I heard nothing about my phone. Calling it only ever went to voicemail. I had also taken the week off, but I did call in to ask if anyone had dropped off my phone, and they still had not. A week went by, and my boyfriend eventually went back home, and I went back to work. I had decided that my phone was long gone, and I was going to have to replace it. I had insurance, so it wasn't going to be a problem, but I still felt a loss. Before I even put in the claim, though, I received a call on my work phone. It was my chocolate. Excited, I answered the phone. Is this Lily? Yeah, you found my phone? You work at that phone store in the Target parking lot, right? Yeah, could you please bring me my phone? I've seen you. I'm in there all the time. I'd be happy to bring you your phone. He seemed like a nice guy, perfectly pleasant. I was about to ask when he thought he might come in, when he said, you have some very lovely pictures on your phone. A flush of embarrassment washed over me as I realized just what he had been looking at on my phone. I hadn't even thought about someone going through the pictures. His voice went hushed, and it gave me a chill. I really like seeing so much of you. I'd like to see it in person. I'm sorry, I have a boyfriend. If you could return my phone, please, I would really appreciate that. Otherwise, I'll just replace it. Thanks. Oh, no, no. I'll bring it to you. I have an account there. I see you all the time. I'll be right in after work. Bye-bye, lovely girl. The call disconnected, and I had no idea what to think. I stood there with my phone to my ear, frozen for a moment, before I finally put it away. Whatever. He would bring me my phone, and I'd tell him I appreciated that, but I was spoken for, and he wasn't going to get to enjoy anything more than my pictures. I went back to helping customers and just trying not to think about it. But in the back of my mind, I kept wondering if every man who came to the counter was him. I felt naked to their eyes, even though I was fully clothed. I began to get sick to my stomach. I finished taking a payment for one customer, and as they stepped from the counter I was closing out their account on, the next person lay a chocolate phone on the counter. It was my phone. I looked up to the face of an average-looking middle-aged man. He smiled, and it seemed like a normal, warm smile. I felt exposed, but I also felt like I might have been worried for nothing. He was a normal person who just happened to see some pictures on a phone. It was embarrassing, but I guess I could be flattered that he liked them. I reached for the phone, and as my fingers touched it, his hand came down on mine. It was a gentle touch, but it was unwelcome. I quickly grasped the phone and pulled my hand back. I looked up at him, puzzled, and he was still smiling. He leaned closer over the counter and spoke in hushed tones. I've done you a big favor. I'm really looking forward to getting one in return. My hand seemed to sting where he'd touched me. My stomach soured. Thank you for returning it, but I'm afraid that's all I can give you. You're very beautiful. He continued as though I'd said nothing. I come in here all the time to pay my bill, usually with my wife. You don't recognize me? Suddenly, I did recognize him, 
Just as he said, he and his wife came in every month to pay their bill. Uh, yeah, I managed to say. I'll try to come in without her next time. Thank you for the pictures. And with that, he straightened up, turned, and left. I should have told someone then, but for some reason I didn't. I figured now that I had my phone, when he came in, I'd just treat him like every other customer. That's what I thought, anyway. Besides, what good would telling anyone do? What could they even do about it? I was the one who took the pictures in the first place. I felt like it was my fault for doing something naughty. I was foolish, and I deserved the attention I was getting because I'd brought it on myself. That's what I kept thinking every time I received a text from him in the next few days. The first one was just, You're so beautiful. I still have your pictures. I really like them. That's when I realized he'd copied the pictures off my phone. Again, I hadn't even thought of that. So he was enjoying my private pictures, even though I'd gotten my phone back. The second text was really shocking to me. It was a picture, proof of his enjoyment of mine. At first, I texted him back. I told him I had a boyfriend already. I told him those pictures were for him alone, and I never intended for anyone else to see them. I told him I wasn't ever going to show him anything in person, and I begged him to just leave me alone. For some stupid reason, I still didn't tell anyone else because I felt like it was my fault for taking the pictures to begin with, as if somehow doing something dirty, though it was in private, and intended only for the viewing pleasure of my boyfriend, I had asked to be treated this way by some stranger. A week later, he came into the store to pay his bill. His wife was with him. They had an issue with the automated machine, and I had to help fix it. He stood all too close as I knelt to work on the machine, and while his wife didn't seem to notice, I was very uncomfortably aware of the situation. Finally, I felt I had to say something to someone. I spoke to my manager. I told him about losing my phone, and about having some personal pictures on it. I felt ashamed as I told him, and felt like he was judging me. He knew the person I was talking about, and his solution was that whenever this customer came in, he'd make sure that someone else would always help him. He would tell the guy that he was no longer allowed to even talk to me. In these days of Me Too, this all seems quite inadequate, but that's how it all went. After the manager spoke with them, there was a short period of silence. He stopped sending me messages, and I didn't see him in the store anymore. Finally, I felt like he was going to forget about the whole thing. Finally, I felt like he was going to forget about the whole thing. About a week later, I worked the closing shift and went to the store on the way home, so it was nearly midnight when I pulled into the driveway. I got out of the driver's seat and shut it, then opened the back door to get out the groceries when I heard the crunch of a footstep on the gravel. I turned around, groceries still in hand, to see him standing there in my driveway. I was stunned. How could this be possible? How could he know where I lived? Before I could think anything else, he stepped closer. Too close. Had my car door been shut, I would have been pinned against it. As it was, the open door was to my right, and on the left I heard the clunk of the cans in the grocery bag hit the side of my car in my haste to back up. I knew at that moment he could push me into the back seat, and I would have little ability to defend myself once there. He was sniveling on about my having betrayed him. I wasn't really listening, though. I was focusing on the straps of the double plastic bag in my left hand and on not being pushed into the back seat where the rest of my groceries sat. In my right, I was still clutching my keys. It was risky to move my right hand as it was helping keep me balanced and from falling back into the car, but I had to do it. I pulled my hand away and jabbed at his face with my keys, forcing him to stumble backward and giving myself the room I needed. I pushed myself away from the car and swung my bag of groceries at him. I was hoping to hit him in the head, but I smacked him square in his shoulder and chest instead. Still, it was enough to knock him onto his ass. I ran for the front door. I felt his hands grab my ankle, but I kicked his hand and just ran. When I got to the door, I was never more grateful to only have two keys. I unlocked it and slid in, slamming the door behind me and throwing on the chain. I heard him slam against the door, and he began pounding on it, demanding to be let in, saying I owed him this and so much more nonsense. Since this was a time before landline phones were obsolete, 
I was able to grab mine and call 911. At the first sound of a siren in the distance, the pounding stopped. They caught him on the way back to his car, parked around the corner. I'll spare you the court details, as it never went very far. I don't really understand why not, but this isn't the place to argue that. What I do know is that a month later, his wife came into the store to pay her bill by herself and remove her now ex from the account. And no matter how annoying it is to have to unlock my phone every time I want to use it, from now on, I always, always lock my phone.